for me and many of the uh, esteemed faculty. And I, I want to thank the uh, Bangalore Orthopedic uh, Association as well as Dr. Bamsi was a longtime friend and uh, associate for education. And we'll take us briefly through the anatomy of the coronoid, the way we classify these injuries, as well as the importance of the coronoid as a contributor of the elbow stability. And we'll look at the distribution of these fractures and touch on the entity term, the various postromedial rotatory instability injury. And finally, we'll cover broadly the approaches as well. Well as treatment strategies. The article superiorly cited coronoid process and a posterior articular transverse groove. And this groove should not be mistaken as an articular defect by the novice surgeon. <clears throat> a longitudinal ridge bisects uh, the trochlear notch dividing the coronoid process into a distinct medial and lateral facet. This ridge, ridge interdigitates with the trochlear groove while the facet perfectly opposes the medial and lateral condyles of the trochlea. From a lateral perspective, the coronoid has a semicircular shape with a superior overhang at the tip of the coronoid process. This 180 degree semicircular capture together with the posteriorly tilted trochlear notch makes the coronoid process a resistor to anterior subluxation of the trochlear projects medially by about 7 millimeters and anteriorly. Approximately 60% of the anteromedial facet is unsupported by the ulnar metaphysis. And this increases ulnar humor. <clears throat> the height of the coronoid and hence the size of coronoid fractures may be simply evaluated over well taken lateral radiograph. Identifying the tip of the coronoid process and the trough of the trochlear notch, one can obtain a coronoid height measurement. In Caucasian males, the average height ranges about 15 to 18 millimeters, and in females, 13 to 15 millimeters. Based on the measurement of the coronoid, we can apply Reagan Morris classification into assigning a fracture type. This was a classification they proposed back in 1989. The type one classification, uh, the type one fractures were thought to be avulsion fractures. We know that's not always true, but they surmised that it did not require treatment. The type two fractures involved less than 50% of what they then thought, and the type three fractures involved more than 50% of the height of the coronoid. Some of the limitations with this system, however, include the assumption one must make that all fracture lines are transverse and may underappreciate anatomic stability of a coronoid fracture. Me. In a cadaveric study to assess the role of the isolated fractures of varying sizes according to the Reagan Mori classification, and then subsequently subjected the forearm to an exhale load with the elbow in varying degrees of flexion. What was seen was there's posterior elbow subluxation, always in the type three fractures, especially between the angles of 60 to 105 degrees of flexion. Um, within this type three fracture group, the absolute size itself did not result in varying degrees of subluxation. <clears throat> This set of elbow injury films, this set of elbow injury films illustrates the important role of a sizable fragment of the coronary fracture in oral humeral stability. Um, am I being hurt? Uh, yeah, uh, you, you're being hurt, but there is some, some interruption in the, I think, internet connection. It's okay, you can go ahead. We are able to hear you. We are with you. Okay. All right. All right. Um, well, this is not a simple olecranon fracture. Cranon separated widely from the trochlea suggests that both the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament and the lateral arm the collateral ligament have been disrupted. While well, in the joint, it will allow us to appreciate the fragmentation of the coronoid together with separate subline tubercles. fragment to which the anterior band of the medial collateral film while demonstrating a reduced humeral joint shows that the coronoid fragment has not been secured. Drop sign can be Dr. seen David, suggesting can you off your, uh, evolving video? instability. Can you off your, Sorry? Can you off your the face video and you can just go with the presentation alone? Okay. Is that is that what it is? 
Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> By four weeks, Frank posterior dislocation. Sorry? Does it make a difference? I don't think so. It's making a difference. No, there is some voice disturbance. It's coming and going. I thought it may be because of the internet connection. Maybe. It um, oh, dear. Okay. Um, well, let me see. Uh, we'll just have to move on then. Um, so this is at four weeks and it's a frank posterior dislocation. And this is due in large part to the failure of the surgeon to restore the important anterior buttress of the olecranon. <clears throat> More recently in the early 2000s, so Driscoll from the Mayo Clinic proposed a new classification for the coronoid fractures and based it on where the fracture lines were according to anatomically defined sites of stability. This classification can only be confidently applied with the use of CT scans, preferably with a 3D reconstruction. In the Odriscoll type 1 fractures, these fractures occur at the tip of S10 or equal to 2 millimeters in size, and a subtype 2, which is more than 2 millimeters of size. These fractures are typically seen in the terrible triad injury. In the type 2 fractures in Odriscoll's classification, <clears throat> the anteromedial facet um, is involved, I mean, involve just the rim. Uh, following the subtype 1, and when it involves a subline tubicle, the varus postural medial rotatory instability injury, when it and when it extends to the subline tubicle, can result in an extremely various unstable elbow. These fractures should be suspected in a coronary fracture dislocation about fracture of the radial hip. The type 3 fracture with the fragment bearing the critical ligaments of stability and a fracture significantly compromising articular architecture and affecting anatomic stability. In a type 3 fracture, the subtype one variant, the coronoid body and its base are fractured, while the subtype 2 fractures are part of the trans basal coronoid fracture pattern. Medial facet fractures in a cadaveric model and simulated uh, various fracture dislocation with increasing fracture severity of the anteromedial facet. For the end following repairs of the detached lateral ulnar collateral ligament, measured elbow stability in flexion, extension, as well as various and valgus stability and rotational stability of the proximal ulna. What the cadaveric biomechanical study showed was small isolated anterior or when the tip was involved as in a subtype 2, kinematic stability was evident with the elbow and various subtype 3 fractures with the extension of the fractures into the subline tubercle not only had more profound abnormality in their kinematics, but also had significant various instability. In a retrospective analysis of 110 coronoid fractures from two level one trauma centers, investigators based on radiographs and CT scans were able to reconstruct the coronoid fracture lines in the injured elbows. Patterns of traumatic uh, instability that were identified include terrible triad injuries, various posterior medial injuries, olecranon fracture dislocations, and Montegia. type variants. These fractures were then classified. What was seen was that the majority of type 1 fractures occurred in terrible triad injuries, and these were the most common injury patterns. Majority of type 2 fractures were seen in the various postural medial rotational instability injuries. And within this uh, group of injuries, this was also the most common fracture pattern. And the type 3s were most commonly seen in the posterior olecranon fracture dislocation medial instability injury when they reported two cases of a medial oblique compression fractures of the coronoid. This was typified by a combination of axial and varus load to the elbow, characteristically leading to a LUCL avulsion and an anteromedial facet fracture. If the fracture involved the sublime tubicle, the MCL would necessarily then be inscribed, illustrated here. In my experience, these findings are more typically seen in the larger fragments or when the presentation is delayed or chronic. 
On the left, the anterior posterior radiographs will demonstrate asymmetric widening of the medial, uh, narrowing of the medial aspect of the ulnar humeral joint and widening of the lateral aspect as well as the radio capitella joint space. On the lateral view, the double crescent sign will be uh, <clears throat> part of the coronoid. However, definitive assessment is best made with CT scans using 3D reconstructions. In the more chronic presentations where pain and swelling has subsided, or sometimes during surgery, I like to utilize stress. Here, the patient has suffered a, a various part of the radio capitella, radio capitella joint and the lateral abdominal humeral joint during various force episodes. The patient's opposite left elbow is also stressed for comparison. David Ring reported the outcomes retrospectively in a group of 18 patients, of which 12 were treated acutely while six presented in a delayed fashion. All of these patients had either a subluxation or dislocation of the elbow joint together with an anteromedial facet injury. What they found at final follow-up was that six patients had residual various subluxation of elbow four of which had not had any surgery to the coronoid, and the remaining two which had loss of fracture fixation. All six, and he does conclude that based on this, that anteromedial facet fractures of the coronoid with associated subluxation or dislocation should have these coronoid fractures treated surgically. Whilst coronoid fractures have the potential to cause elbow instability, some fractures may be non-surgically managed. Certainly isolated small type 1 fractures can be treated this way. And quite often, the type 1 fracture sustains in terrible triad injuries may not require fixation as illustrated in this case. Graham King and associates were able to successfully treat a group of patients with anteromedial facet fracture dislocations non-surgically, provided in their series that their dislocations were reducible, remain concentrically reduced, extension to a good amount of flexion while maintaining stability. In the next segment of the talk, we will cover some of the surgical approaches as well as fixation strategies as well as the role of grafting the coronoid process. This film demonstrates an elbow dislocation in a 47-year-old man who fell on his right upper limb from dancing on the tabletop. A sizable coronoid fragment is seen without extension into the sublime tubercle, at least visibly on x-rays. This would be probably a various postural medial uh, injury with a subtype 2 uh, of the Odriscoll type 2 classification. 3D CT reconstruction demonstrates this to be a largely uh, single and sizable anteromedial rim and tip injury, which would be amenable to screw fixation. And in the lower right corner, the sublime tubercle uh, uh, has clearly been spared from this injury. As with most, with most complex dislocations, I favor starting with a lateral approach. And in this picture, we, could, we can see the typical bare lateral epicondyle signifying the LUCL avulsion injury together with the common extensors. Through an EDC splitting approach and a partial posterior release of the supinator and the annual ligament of the forearm exposed the coronoid process fracture. This can be secured with multiple screws while also direct. visualizing the trochlear notch and assuring joint the complex and this common extensor or as well and as all with all complex dislocations I performed the hanging gravity extension test to determine stability has been restored. Patients such as these are typically commenced on an overhead motion protocol immediately post-surgery in my practice and at about five months post-op the elbow joint remains congruous with fixation in situ and a fracture union evident. Patient achieve excellent range of right elbow motion, forearm rotation, and near normal grip strength and unhindered return to activity. This set of x-rays represent a more significant injury to the right elbow of a 78-year-old man who fell down three flights of stairs. Even in the post-reduction lateral film, the, the coronoid fracture with an intact radial head pointing uh, with arrows pointing to us. This typically represents the tip and anteromedial rim. On the anterior posterior projections, the fracture the sublime tubercle can be seen. Uh, this would represent the sub 
type 3 fracture of the anteromedial facet injury of the coronoid, and I always incorporate a medial approach on top of the lateral approach to adequately treat these complex injuries. The CT scan illustrates the extent of the osseous injury as well as the size of the fragments and the degree of fragmentation, which would not only dictate approach, but fixation techniques. After isolating structures on the lateral aspect, I direct my attention medially to an and through an extensile approach, um, first generously decompressing the ulnar nerve and transposing it away from the center of the field. I perform a medial over the top exposure of the joint, detaching the common flexor peroneta origin together with a humeral head of the FCU, taking care not to cut through the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament, which is seen over here. I have my retractor under the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament here and with traction on the legal fragment is moving together uh, with traction implying instability. I typically build up the medial fragment first using headless and cortical screws into the intact ulnar metaphysis. However, this does nothing for the tip and anteromedial rim as highlighted by this arrow. Following which anterior posteriorly directed headless and cortical screws are passed through the tip and at this point a congruous arnohumeral joint surface can be observed. A buttress plate using a con a 2 mm mini plate is applied to buttress visible here however and this means followed by a gravity hanging extension test that demonstrates joint stability in full extension. At six months this gentleman has achieved a remarkable outcome in spite of his injury and age. Now, of course part of the requisite to achieve this is a well-fixed and reduced fracture dislocation. The arnold humeral joint is symmetric. The fracture. This next case is not a simple olecranon fracture. Close examination of the x-rays will reveal the anterior medial facet of the cor coronoid is fractured and has come off together with the condyle. The radial head is intact and in its position indicates there's a dislocation of the elbow. Join. This is termed the various postural medial. We adopt a posterior approach. As always, CD scans are helpful to identify fragments and a degree of fragmentation. I start first by achieving alignment of the proximal ulna and passing a proximal to distal and axial wire, separate and displaced from the axis of the proximal ulna. I then apply a reduction clamp. The fragment taking care to avoid the ulnar nerve before driving a wire into the coronoid fragment in a posterior to anterior lateral to medial direction and then this is followed with an additional screw. Since this is a sizable fragment, I just need to reduce and hold it before applying the plate and making some fractures, reduction may be done through direct vision. I then go on to stabilize the olecranon, inserting multiplexing the lateral epicondyl fracture with multiple headless screws. That final follow-up fracture union is evident, and the joint remains well reduced. The patient has achieved satisfactory elbow range of motion. This final case illustrates a terrible triad injury with a sizable coronoid fracture. The surgeon who performed the index procedure coronoid fixation, understandably, as it appeared community. This resulted in overstuffing of the radial head. And the x-rays on the right support this with the asymmetric arnohumeral joint space with a gross amount of lateral widening and a free-floating coronoid fragment anterior superiorly. As a consequence, the patient suffered limited and painful elbow flexion extension, present presenting six months after her index procedure. The surgical strategy adopted in this case was to remove the radial head and to make use of autologous olecranon process as an osteochondral graft. Pre-alternative planning to assess the volume of the physiotomy, and this graft is then shaped and transferred anteriorly to recreate the anterior buttress. And this is then secured with headless screws. This technique was originally described by Moritomo in a small case report and to date has been reproduced in several other case reports. Other sources of grafts reportedly used for reconstruction include dis discarded radial head fragments and costal chondral rib grafts. At three year follow up, she
She has maintained and maintained modest improvement in her motivated post-traumatic degenerative change, but the question of what to do with the coronoid fracture and a terrible tri injury arises, especially when the radial hit has been adequately fixed or replaced. Based on the earlier epidemiological study, we know majority of these coronoid fractures are type 1 injuries. Of course, this should be verified by the surgeon before planning for the procedure. That being the case, various authors have described the use of the lasso procedure as well as suture anchor repairs of the capsule to the remnant coronoid, <clears throat> an approach which I'll mention but do not favor in view of its propensity to increase the risk of flexion contracture. In such instances, I've variably explored medially and found either complete medial collateral ligament disruptions, which when repaired, restored stability or elected. To summarize, we need to appreciate the importance of coronoid as a buttress and huge subluxation of the trochlea. In the face of laser, one needs to recognize that coronoid fractures can occur in multiple and varied elbow injury scenarios, and recognition is indispensable and should be done when planning a surgical management strategy for the coronoid fracture. Currently, there's a growing consensus supporting more aggressive treatment of anterior medial facet fractures on top of fractures more than 50% of the coronoid type. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. Uh, hold on, actually, we'll finish with the next two talks, then come back for a, a complete discussion. So, Dr. Chaitanya, are you ready or should we? Uh, yes, sir, now it is visible, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, Thank you, sir. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know what happened to my computer. It crashed. So, let's start this again. So, here we are. We saw this before an elbow that looks reasonably normal clinically, but a radiograph that shows it's clearly dislocated and there's a fragment that's completely displaced. So when faced with something like this, my first order of business is to do a reduction and get traction views. Now traction views have been shown in distal radius fractures to have great uh, use in planning surgery, especially in resource poor nations or resource poor environments. But sometimes even traction views do not give you adequate information. So what do we do next? For me, getting a CT has become pretty much routine for all my distal humerus fractures because they enable me to see a 360 view. So we looked at uh, the role of 3D CT in our department and we found that 3Ds are much easier to interpret for most surgeons than 2Ds. 3Ds are better to analyze metaphysical comminution and 3Ds are better for understanding where to put your hardware. However, 2Ds are better for identifying coronal fracture lines. Now, when you're faced with something like this, it is tempting to think that this might be a simple capitellar fracture. But when you get a CT scan, you can see from the arrows that there's clearly a well-defined, very low transcondylar coronal fracture line, which if ignored, could displace in the post-operative rehabilitation phase, giving us trouble. The person we saw before, we got traction views, you can see them on the lower left-hand side, and you think you have enough information. But when you look at the posterior aspect of the lateral column, you see the amount of comminution is so extensive that it helps you understand that any hardware placed there will not have adequate purchase. So preoperative planning after having seen this is critical. For me, this has become my favorite toy when I'm looking at, three, at uh, distal humerus fractures because having a model in my hand really helped me to plan my surgical procedure and my hardware placement. As they say, if you fail to plan, then you might be planning to fail. So here you are, this is a diabetic with a grade one open, which I took care of in another country. And uh, this is about seven days out with an open wound. Here she is with the CT, and this gives you a reasonable idea of the degree of comminution, the degree of displacement, and you can see the spike of the proximal fragment which buttonholes to the skin. So when we looked at the 3Ds, and I put them together with some tape that gave me a sense of the size of the fragments, it gave me a sense of where I would put my hardware and I quickly realized that on the lateral side, I did not have enough bone. So I decided to go with the posterior lateral plate based on this modeling and with a medial plate. And that's what we did. We planned our surgery, put a posterior lateral plate on and a medial plate. And here we are, after you look at having placed it, 
This is a post-op CT which shows you an excellent anatomic restoration. This is a 3D model of a post-op CT. And not surprisingly, when you restore anatomy, it is possible to have a reasonable outcome at one year. So that was lesson number two about planning. What happens if you get into the operating room or you see a patient in the pre-op holding area, um, unbeknownst to you, who shows up like this? It is smart not to operate in situations like this. If you see a skin that looks like this, this is not an abrasion. This is full thickness skin death. And if you operate through something like this, you run the risk of your post-operative wound looking something like this and inevitable sepsis. So it's always prudent to wait for swelling and blisters to resolve, especially when dealing with complex fractures. Now, this is something that is very critical to me and for my residents and fellows when I teach them about positioning. There are four areas which can burn you when you're recovering from surgery. The first one is the blue arrow where you have to take care to make sure that the, you get your brachial plexus padded and an axillary roll is placed on the contralateral side to avoid pressure on the contralateral brachial plexus. The black arrow points to the breast and the nipples, especially in women with large pendulous breasts because the nipple, if not protected, can undergo necrosis. The red arrow points to genitalia, especially in men, because if you don't pay attention to that, you can end up with necrosis of the prepuce. And finally, the light blue arrow points to the area of the lateral popliteal nerve, which must be completely free of any compression because these cases can be very long and can take time. And if you don't realize this, then it can leave you with a lateral popliteal palsy. For all these cases, I inevitably use a Foley catheter. Now, ulnar nerve must be protected. So knowing the anatomy of the ulnar nerve is critical. So for example, here we are, you know that the ulnar nerve goes in between the two heads of the FCU at about 5 cm and the raphe of the FDS of the middle finger is located at 7 cm. At 8 cm proximally, you have your arcade of struthers. So you have to see all these because you're going to transpose the ulnar nerve, at least I do. And when I transpose the ulnar nerve, I got to be prepared to know my anatomy. So here we are, the blue arrows pointing to your arcade of struthers and that's why in the operative field, I release them as you can see in the picture on the left and on the right side, the extensive decompression of the ulnar nerve, which can then be transposed safely at the end of your fixation. Very little importance is given to the radial nerve and I don't quite understand why. It is really critical to know that at 10 centimeters proximal to the joint line, the radial nerve is usually located at the lateral intermuscular septum. And that's great if you have an intact skeleton. But if you don't have an intact skeleton, which is what we have here when you have a fracture, it is all the more critical to make sure that you mark out your anatomy, like shown here. I mark out the lateral and the medial side denoted by L and M, so I don't get uh, disoriented and lost. I mark out the location of the radial nerve uh, at its origin, at its uh, point of it coming through the lateral intermuscular septum, which is about 10 centimeters. And I further proximally also show myself where I might get into trouble if I go too far proximal. Once I've done all that, now I'm ready to make my olecranon osteotomy. Now, the olecranon osteotomy is best made through this area, which is the bare area in the olecranon where you don't have any articular cartilage. But the question is, how do you find it? So I expose on either side of the olecranon, and then I pass a wet sponge with an instrument that's inserted from the lateral side to emerge on the medial side, so that I pull my sponge through to emerge laterally and I protect my ulnar nerve, not with this vessel loop as shown here, this is an older slide, but I protect it more with this broad band, a Penrose drain, which does not put focal compression on the ulnar nerve. I then make an osteotomy through the bare area as shown here. Sorry about that. Now the osteotomy is made in the shape of a chevron, which goes not all the way through, but about 80 to 85% all the way through the olecranon. And the rest of it is simply wedged open with the help of a broad osteotome. Okay, so we've reached the fracture. Now, if you have the complex fracture that we saw before, what do we use? Well, you realize from the previous x-ray here that you didn't have much bone to play with. You saw from the CT scan, there was extensive metaphysical comminution. 
So you have to modify and make things up to make them work for the situation that you're faced with. In this case, I chose to use a pelvic reconstruction plate through which I put a four millimeter cannulated screw with a head and that fit perfectly. So I used my guide wire, I placed it there. So I got one point of fixation very well. I contoured the plate in situ and then I used a tension band around the proximal screw hole and around the distal screw hole to give myself two points of fixation, which is all I would get given the degree of comminution. And here he's at eight months, he was back to doing his job as a roofer. How about this lady that we saw, where we saw this very low transcondylar coronal fracture in addition to what was billed as a capitular fracture when she was sent to me. So I chose to go transolecranon and I neutralized that coronal fracture with these columnar screws which are headless and were placed through the articular surface. And I used a headed screw with the washer to behave as a one hole plate. And I fixed the capitular fracture with screws that came from posterior to anterior. Again, predictable, reliable outcome. Now all capital of fractures are not the same. You know that sometimes they can look strange and oftentimes they are accompanied by lateral column, uh, columnar comminution and posterolateral impaction. We know that because Mike McKee showed this to us, that when you see a capital of fracture which has a double shadow like this, it is not a capital of fracture. It is almost always a fracture of the capitalum which extends past the capital trochlear sulcus going all the way across as shown in these other x-rays. In such situations, I use a trick taught to me by Dr. Jupiter, wherein you can take the lateral condyle and osteotomize it, and that allows you to book the elbow open on the medial complex. Now you're looking at the entire articular surface on FAS, and you can fix it and close the book, and then reattach the lateral column or the condyle with the help of tension band. Here we are looking at what looks like a capital or fracture, but when you look at the yellow arrow, it is showing you basically that there's a lateral condylar fracture as well. And the two red arrows are showing you what appears to be impaction of the posterior surface. Now this impaction is very critical because if you don't disimpact it, then your capital of fragment will not sit back into place. So being aware of it is really, really important ahead of time. Because when you get in there, you gently disimpact it with an ostrotome or a freer elevator, and your capitalum will sit back very easily, giving you a predictable outcome. Again, we used, if you notice, I used a pelvic recon plate, and I used screws in different planes, and here I am using a cannulated headed screw through the pelvic recon plate, which is a great trick to know when you have little bone to play with. Now, Roger, hi Roger, I know you're here. And uh, great to see you. And Roger showed us this many years ago when he said that when you're dealing with a radial head fracture, be prepared to look for other lesions. And guess what? We decided, yes, that's correct. And uh, it was a very good message that he gave us. And we call this lesion the kissing lesion, where you can have radial head fracture and capitular fracture at the same time. So this is called the kissing lesion. And you can see here, there's a displaced radial head fracture causing a block to forearm rotation, a displaced capitular fracture, posterior lateral impaction, as well as a lateral condylar fracture. So we put the posterior lateral impaction back, we fix the capitellum, fix the radial head, and a tension band to put the lateral column back in place. Again, predictable, reliable outcomes at six months. Now, oftentimes you're dealing with these fragments because they are small and they rotate in a predictable manner externally. So how to get them back in place? Well, you put K wires, which are 1.6 millimeter K wires and use them as joysticks and use them to close the book. Your condylar surfaces come together and it's easy to fix them. But what do you do if you have so many fragments? You cannot use K wires as joysticks, but you have to start putting these things back together piecemeal like a jigsaw puzzle. In this case, I prefer to use the best kept secret in hand surgery, also known as threaded K wires. These threaded K wires can be drilled once and cut flush and they behave as perfect headless screws, as you can see here. All these are threaded K wires restoring the articular surface and you can get a reasonable radiographic outcome as well as a reasonable clinical outcome. Now, what you're also going to notice here that in this case, we use parallel plates. But if you use parallel plates or if you use 9090 plates, it is critical that they do not end at the same level to avoid causing a stress riser. The standard teaching is that articular surfaces must be restored first and then the columns, but that is not always the case. 
if you have large fragments like this, you may be lucky in restoring the articular surface and then putting your plates on. But, and if, and if you do that, again, you're gonna see that we use 90-90 plates here. They ended at different levels and you could get a predictable outcome. But if you have something like this where the entire distal humerus is multi-fragmentary, then you have to rely on taking the better column and putting it back together. But when you do that, you have to be prepared to use an intermediate size plate to convert that multi-fragmentary columnar fracture basically into a two-part fracture, to restore the column, and then come back to the articular surface. Now, what you're also going to see here is the use of a tension band. So when you have less bone to play with, be prepared to augment your fixation with the liberal use of a tension band. And this is the young lady at 12 days before she went back to her own country. And you can see that she's restored reasonable motion even in just about two weeks. You don't always need fancy plates like I've showed you. If you have pelvic reconstruction plates, you can make them work for you. Now, this is a very low transcondylar fracture. What do you do in this case? Well, you have very little bone to play with. This case was done nearly 20 odd years ago. And in those days, we used pelvic reconstruction plates and we wrapped it around the medial condyle to give us an additional layer of fixation and additional plane of fixation. But what if you don't even have that possibility? Then in that case, I prefer to use an old tension band technique, which allows me to restore one column while I put a plate on the other column. Now you're going to notice that I've used tension bands to restore the olecranon in some cases and in plates in some cases. And I do that so as to teach my residents and fellows different techniques. There is no other scientific explanation for that. Finally, oftentimes you're going to find that the articular surface is destroyed and you don't have enough bone to restore it. So in that case, I use allograft bone chips and I fill the bone voids. And then I cover them with this layer of fibrin glue to seal, which gives, and you allow it to set completely. It gives you a beautifully looking surface, which behaves almost like an articular surface in my opinion allowing the patient to get a reasonable outcome. Now here's this lady who uh, unfortunately had a substance abuse problem, so she went into rehab right away. She didn't have any rehab for the elbow. You notice we used a tension band, and at six months, without any rehabilitation for the elbow, she had a reasonable outcome. Clearly not great, but reasonable. So I'm gonna stop here, and once again, sorry for having the mix up, and I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaitanya. It was a great talk. So we'll, uh, we'll take up questions only pertaining to this talk that's on distal humerus of uh, humerus fractures. Sure. So Dr. Uh, Rajin Naik and uh, Dr. Uh, Uday Kumar will go ahead with the questions. I'll just put the video. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, this is Dr. Rajiv Naik here. Uh, very good morning. Uh, it was a very good talk. Well, uh, there are some questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, if you could take them. Uh, you have uh, said about olecranon osteotomy. Is there any possibility that you could avoid an olecranon osteotomy? Yes. Yes. Or, or, or what are your uh, uh, preferences of a trap approach or a tricep splitting approach or whatever? That is one thing that if you could comment, it would be. Sure. So I, I tried to predominantly focus on comminuted intraarticular fractures of the distal humerus. That's why I showed only olecranon osteotomies. But if you have a reasonable distal humerus fracture, which uh, where your condylar fragments are large and not comminuted, it is reasonable to do paratricipital approaches so you can see the joint from both sides without having to do an olecranon osteotomy. For me personally, the way I was trained, and if you notice, I said this is 30 year experience. So the way I was trained was with an electron osteotomy because in those days we didn't make these paratricipital approaches. And the way my brain works is I see things three dimensionally much better when I do an electron osteotomy. So I prefer to use that. But that being said, if you have large articular fragments, it is completely reasonable to do a paratricipital approach in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, the second question from the audience, which column do you fix first? <laughs> so that's a, that's a very good question. So like I said before, traditionally the teaching is when you have an articular fracture, you restore the articular surface first. Then you convert the multifragmentary fracture to a two-part fracture. But it doesn't always work that way. 
So in that case, I go to the article, I mean, I go to the column that's least comminuted and restore that first. And then I build off that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, an extension of, the, of this question, uh, is there a possibility that you should fix both the columns or can you get away with a single column fixation in intra-articular fractures? So if you, if you notice that there are sometimes the fracture, uh, fracture plane doesn't go all the way across uniformly. I would prefer to fix both columns, but you can't always get plates on both columns. There's a big difference. So when I can't get a plate on the other column, I will try and put a tension band on the other column. I don't like to do just one column of fixation unless it's in one column fragment. Um, so. yeah, that is uh, that, that message is well conveyed, sir. There is an interesting question from the audience. Mm -hmm. With your experience, they want you to talk on whether you do anything differently in such cases. Uh, which cases, sir? In such intra-articular fractures, uh, the whatever you have said is the standard teaching. Yeah. The audience wants to know whether you do the, anything differently. So, you know, standard teaching is good for standard cases. But every, yes. patient, every patient doesn't read the textbook before they come to you with a broken elbow. So, um, my favorite thing to tell my residents is, read the textbook, but keep an open mind and make things up as you go along. You saw how many tricks I showed you. They were all made up at the time of fixation because I realized that standard teaching was not helping me. But standard yes, teaching sir. helped me with my principles. I hope you brought out these points very well. And uh, I will see whether any more questions are there. Just hold on for a minute. Sure. Just hold on for a, for a moment. Okay. You showed me. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. You showed the coronal shear fractures of the trochlea and the capitulum. Yeah. Now, which approach do you think is the best uh, method? So, again, uh, yeah. traditionally, I've always. Fractures. The anterior so, fractures. Yeah. Right. So, if you have a. Uh, if you have a fracture which is a it's a shear of the capitellum, for me it, uh, it's very straightforward to approach it laterally, okay. and I can put screws either anterior posterior or posterior anterior as the case may be. If it is going across into the capitular trochlear sulcus, again I approach it laterally, but I may or may not take off the lateral condyle like I showed you, yeah. and book the humerus open, uh, the elbow open. If in addition to that, I also have a coronal fracture where the, where the entire distal humeral articular surface will move as one unit. Then I will do a transolacranon okay. and fix it that way. Because what happens when I do that is I will restore my articular surface first. Then I use my radial head as a reduction tool okay. because the radial head impacts against the capitellum and holds it reduced in place. And then it makes it very easy for me to fix the whole thing back to the shaft. And this, this uh, you are doing in the prone position itself? No, I do it in the lateral position over a bolster, like I showed you. Okay. Have you have you done this approach in the supine position, doing the olecranon osteotomy, and then hyperflexing the elbow? I haven't. Again, like I said, the way my brain thinks, I'm used okay. to seeing them that way. Okay. And, and you know, it's, it's funny how our psychomotor skills are developed based yes. on how you understand three-dimensional anatomy. I don't think one method works for everyone. For me, that method works. Okay. Yes, that's sir, very nice. Sir, there are two more questions from sir, the audience. Sir, yes. Uh, yes. One, is, uh, uh, one is the role of bone grafting. Mm -hmm. And second is an indication for a CT scan in all cases of suspected capitalum fractures. Yes. So yeah. I'll take the second one first. Yeah. Every distal humerus fracture in my, in my uh, hands gets a CT scan. I, so I, there is no two ways about it because I've... So this is a take home message for the audience that every... Absolutely. I, I mean, if you can, if you can, I'm not going to say it is mandatory because I know that the audience in different parts of the world may or may not have access to CTs. Yeah. But if you can, please get a CT. That's number one. Number Perfect. two... 
using bone graft, I'm very liberal with it. I don't use uh, autologous bone graft because uh, we have access to, uh, you know, bone bank bone. So uh, I use allograft bone chips. I mince them up and use them. You are not worried about HO, uh, heterotopic ossification? No, no uh, I'm worried about HO, but uh, oftentimes the HO in my experience tends to be in the front and it doesn't seem to make a difference to outcome because I move them after the wound has healed. So uh, like you saw in my outcomes, uh, and I agree, I, have, I'm, I showed you some bad outcomes also in the lady who didn't rehab. But again, she formed HO not because of anything else. She formed HO because she didn't rehab. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I can have a chicken here. Uh, so uh, we'll go with the next speaker, that is uh, Dr. Professor Roger Von Reed, who's an exclusive uh, elbow surgeon from Antwerp, Belgium. So he did his uh, orthopedic residency from University of Antwerp. Then he completed his PhD in 2014 from the research on the radial head performed at the Mayo Clinic. So after that, he pursued further fellowships from Monash University in Melbourne and all and Hospital in Australia. So he was the first president of Belgium, Belgian Elbow and Shoulder Society and a current member of the board. So he's a pioneer in orthoscopic surgery of the elbow and administered many international athletes. So currently he's a visiting professor at the University of Antwerp. So he's also involved in development of a new elbow process. So today he'll be talking to us on radial head fractures, whether to fix or replace. Prof. Van Riet, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Ramsey, and uh, for organizing all this. Um, so I was asked to talk about radial head fractures, whether to fix or to replace. Um, I do have a disclaimer. I'm a consultant with Acumed, and I'm a designer of a, a post-op immobilizer by Jake Design. So as you know, radial head fractures are the most common elbow fractures. Um, you get them by falling on your outstretched hand, mainly in slight flexion and pronation. Like we saw before, one third of radial head fractures have clinically detectable associated lesions, and that's important. The treatment is either conservative with early mobilization with or without aspiration of the joint, or surgical with open reduction internal fixation, resection of some fragments or the entire radial head, or um, a replacement of the radial head. This is how you, resect, uh, how you aspirate uh, the joint. So type one radial head fracture, you don't see the fracture. As you can see in the back, there's a fat pad sign, which means there's a hemarthrosis. The patient has pain and uh, is unable to move the elbow fully. So if, if you see the patient early enough, so maybe within the first couple of days, you can still aspirate the joint. So this in fact, uh, I need a new video because this one is without gloves, but I um, need one with gloves, I guess. Aspirate the joint. You can get about 15 to 20 milliliters out of the elbow, and this helps the patients a lot. It's uh, less, way less painful, and they start moving straight away. You see the little fat cells in there, and this patient can't believe what happened in, in about 10 seconds between um, not before the aspiration and after the aspiration. It's debatable whether, whether you want to use some local anesthetic. I don't, because the local anesthetic simply uh, adds another uh, volume to the elbow. So I don't use local, I just get them going and get them moving straight away. Results are very good. Uh, 21 year follow up, full range of motion in this uh, series, 10% at mild occasional pain, but only with heavy lifting and no objective impairment. Um, there was a mild increase in degenerative changes, but no real um, osteoarthritis in this patient group. There, there is a role for surgery, and that's when there, there are associated lesions. So in this patient, for example, type 1 real lap fracture, but clearly unstable, uh, this patient deserves surgery. If there's a block to rotation, so if, if you have a patient that's a, that has a lot of pain, and you rotate the forearm passively, if the rotation is blocked, you can or cannot do an aspiration, um, maybe some local anesthetic in that case. If it's still blocked after the local anesthetic, they might need surgery as well, because you might have a little fragment of uh, cartilage interposed in the um, in the articulation and that will lead to a bad result. Type 2, and that's the type we're talking about today, um, per definition by, May, by the Mason classification from 54, more than two millimeter displacement or more than one third of the radial head involved. We get a CT scan like uh, we heard before uh, in distal humerus fractures. The threshold to get a CT scan in radial head fractures is very, very low. 
not only to look at the displacement, but only to also to look at associated, associated lesions such as coronary fractures, um, anteromedial facet fractures, which, which are very hard to see on, uh, on uh, plain x-rays and can be seen on a CT. So threshold for CT scan is low, although not everyone needs a CT scan, obviously. The treatment until the 20th century is mobilization, immobilization, fragment removal, or relapse resection. And in the early 20th century, 1909, as far as I know, this was the first published case of an open reduction and internal fixation of the radial head. It was published by Alban Lambot, who was one of the pioneers of, uh, of uh, ORIF. He's a Belgian surgeon that worked in Antwerp. We're still doing more or less the same. We, maybe we have some more fancy screws. Uh, we have antibiotics, which is a big deal. Um, unfortunately, most of Alban's patients uh, uh, develop some sepsis or uh, arth uh, septic arthritis. Luckily, we don't have that problem anymore as much as he did, obviously. And this is what we do. We'll see if it wants to play. I'm sorry, it's supposed to play now. I'll just forward it for you. So this is a patient with uh, with a small uh, radial head fracture. It's uh, displaced about four millimeters. He did have a, um, or she did have a, um, a block to rotation. So we decided to open it up. I'm not really not sure why it's not playing. Let's see if I can get it to play like this. So we decided to open it up. Uh, what we do here is we feel palpate the LCL complex. If you go anterior to the, to the LCL complex, you can open um, the extensor uh, digitorum communis. So you do an EDC split. It's just in front of the Kaplan uh, uh, approach. Um, you get obviously get the hemarthrosis, get rid of that, rinse the joint, make sure that, clean, that you clean it up and there you can see the fracture. We know from the CT scan, and that's why the CT scan is so helpful, that there's not a lot of displacement at the front, but the most of the displacement will be at the back. And that's where it is. So we use a punch to punch it up. Instead of opening the fragment and um, disinfecting it, we actually prefer to impact it a little bit more even. So when you go from distal to, do it to proximal, you punch it up, you get a nice reduction of the fracture fragments. And one of the biggest advantages is that because of your compaction, um, you have some bone to work with. Because sometimes if you disimpact the fracture and you open the fracture, you, you lose uh, part of the bone and it's very difficult for the screws to, uh, to get hold of your fracture fragments. So once you've done that, we prefer to use headless screws, which you can use uh, uh, screws with the head as long as you sink them under the surface, there's no problem um, for this fracture fragment. Close up the LCL complex. If you need to use an anchor to, uh, to reattach and um, fix the um, extensor tendons. We do suture the annular ligament separately because I feel, of, because I know it's an integral part of the LCL complex. So if you leave the LCL, uh, the annular ligament open, you might end up with an unstable elbow just because of that. Close the extensor tendons, and you can see you can do this with a relatively small incision that we close. Over the years, we've gone smaller and smaller. Um, you can use fluoroscopy if you want to guide your, um, your uh, incision. Um, we just palpate the LCL complex. We know that we can get anterior to the LCL complex, so we can do this more, more or less percutaneously. Open the annular ligament sharply, reduce the fracture, and then put a screw, one or two screws in to uh, get it stable. This was a bit, little bit more difficult, this patient. We uh, had to use a few more screws because of all the fragments, but this is about six weeks post-op and this patient is doing well. And this is uh, not a, an exception. Patients tend to do very well if you uh, get them early and if you're able to get a, a nice reduction and screw fixation. We see that from literature as well. So good to excellent results in 93% and range of motion definitely within the, uh, within the functional range. The paper by David Ring, 2002, but the results are similar today. Advantage of fixation is reconstruction and preservation of the articular surface. That's very important because we want to keep the articular surface because this one is riding up against the capitellum. And as soon as you start replacing the radial head by a metal prosthesis, uh, we know that the metal is much harder than the capitellum. Even if you use a, a pyrocarbon or if you use different materials, the capitellum will suffer if it's not uh, aligned with, uh, with its own cartilage. There's a disadvantage as well because re reconstruction and preservation of the articular surface is simply not always possible. So there's too many little pieces that you can't uh, fix with screws or maybe little th threaded pins like we saw before. 
then uh, patients do very, very poorly. So you need to have a stable fixation at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, procedure, otherwise the patient will not do well. So in literally 100% of my cases, we'll start moving the day after surgery. This is a patient where we thought we could still do a reconstruction. You see, uh, even radial prosthesis were not that easy because of the because of the split in the um, in the neck. So we thought we could uh, we could definitely fix this. We tried, and you see by the amount of hardware I had to use that um, that was not perfect. It was stable, but not perfect. And very quickly afterwards, the uh, problem started to develop. And unfortunately, he ended up with a, a big avascular chunk of radial head. And, uh, and that ended up obviously in a non-union and a very poor result. And we probably should have done this straight away from the, from the beginning, put a radial head prosthesis in. Radial head prosthesis uh, do well when you use them primary and they don't do very well when you do them late. Um, this is the only series as far as I know, uh, published by Andras Heink in 2010. And this is a, um, a series from Mayo Clinic, eight patients, metallic radial head prosthesis averaged three years post resection and five of them filled within three years. So they do very poorly, whereas if you get them early and primary, they may do quite well. This is one of our patients that was uh, uh, replaced at a later stage as well. And what you can see in the radial head, uh, in the capitellum there, is that the radial head is eating away the capitellum. Obviously that's painful and um, patient developed uh, uh, stiffness. She refused surgery. And interestingly, while the capitellum was wearing away, the pain sort of went away as well, but obviously that's not, not ideal. The, we postulated back then that the main reason for this was the disuse osteoporosis. So when you're not loading the capitellum, it will become soft. And if it becomes soft and then you put a radial head prosthesis in, a metal radial head, um, it will eat out um, or eat into the capitellum. Type three fractures, uh, per definition, they're fractures that are non-reconstructable. So on the table, you might give it a go, but if you can't reconstruct them, um, we call them type three. And in type three fractures, you can either resect or you can replace them with a prosthesis. And resection is, uh, although it's, it's very attractive, um, we prefer not to do them. 90% satisfactory at 25 years by Samuel Antunia, but satisfactory doesn't mean good. It means that the patients learn to live with it. So 90% of these patients learn to live with it. 10% did not. And uh, patients that have a radial head fracture are very often very young patients. So patients that, um, that need their elbow for manual labor, for sports, et cetera, et cetera. And even in the, in the paper that they published, in, in one of the patients that they published, you see the proximal migration of the radial head. So this patient must have some problems with the wrist. Unfortunately, when we see patients like this following radial head resection, they're very difficult to deal with. This patient is unstable, has some heterotopic bone in the back. Um, you can be pretty sure that the, that the, the the coronary process is worn out a little bit as well. So these patients do very poorly. Even worse, this one, that's too late. This one, it, we, we, I don't have to look very far to get examples of poor uh, patients following a radial head resection. This is a dreaded Essex Lopresti or longitudinal radio ulnar dissociation where this patient had a radial head fracture that was removed, uh, where the fragments were, were removed, IOM rupture and a rupture of the TFCC leading to a displacement of the um, radius relative to the ulna. So the radius and the carpus move proximal, the ulna stays in place here, and what happens is you get an abutment on the ulna side with pain and uh, often some deviation in the wrist. This is not my patient, this is a patient of Dr. Morris. Um, I was lucky enough to work with him and um, he allowed me to publish this case. So this was a patient who had a radial head fracture four years before, had a radial head prosthesis because of problems with the prosthesis the radial prosthesis was taken out by Dr. Mori. He tested the, the patient on the table. So he was 100% sure there was no uh, dissociation at that point. There was no valgus instability at that point. And they were sure that, um, uh, that the, the elbow and the forearm were stable. Unfortunately, a couple of years later, it showed not to be stable. So the ligaments had not healed despite the fact that on the table, they seemed to be okay. Again, young patient, um, I think he was in his 50s when he got uh, a total elbow replacement plus a very big uh, on the shortening with, uh, with problems in the wrist. So when you look at prosthesis, um, this is a clear indication. Valgus stress, and you see how the elbow will dislocate if I don't do anything. 
So I'm not pushing as hard as I can, but if I wanted to, it's very easy for me to dislocate this elbow just simply with, with the pressure of one finger. So this patient needs something instead of the radial head and obviously the radial head prosthesis because in this patient, we were unable to reconstruct his own radial head. This is the second reason. On the table, the radial pull test by, uh, described by Adam Smith from the US. So what you do is you resect the fragments if you're not able to re reconstruct them in a stable fashion. So restrict, uh, resect the fragments, put a big clamp on the radial stump and start pulling on the radius. If there is more than two millimeter displacement, it's probably pathological. And obviously in this case, um, there was way more than two millimeter displacement. You see the plate on the ulna, that was an old fracture, had nothing to do with this, uh, with this current um, uh, trauma. But again, this is a reason to do something about longitudinal stability. I know some people will prefer to uh, reconstruct the IOM or put some pins in the distal radial joint to fix and fix the uh, TFCC. But in my hands, these patients deserve a uh, real head prosthesis. So for me, these are the are clear indications for radial head prosthesis. Non-reconstructable radial head, resect the radial head and test the stability. And then if it's unstable, either in, valgus, uh, in the valgus direction or in the longitudinal direction, they get a radial head prosthesis. I'm not sure what's happening with my movies, but this again is, is one of my patients. It, uh, it's, um, it's, more, um, it's more dramatic if you see the video, but he falls and this is not flexion. This is valgus stress. So he, he, he gets a valgus stress on his elbow. And then obviously he ruptures his medial collateral ligament um, and he fractures his radial head in this way. So his, his radial head was completely smashed. He's only 19, so we still prefer to fix it if we can. So here you go, uh, same way as what we did before. We palpate the uh, lateral collateral ligament if we can, do a um, extensor tendon split. We stay anterior to the LCL complex. Even if there's been an evulsion of the LCL complex, you can still often palpate it. And by just staying in line with the LCL complex, you don't disturb it. So when you reinsert it afterwards, it's much easier to, uh, to fix it. So that was his fracture, um, lots of pieces. But when you look at it like this, it doesn't look too bad, but when you look at it like that, you know why we, we were unable to, re uh, to reconstruct this one because this is only a, flat, uh, a flake of cartilage. We were not able to put screws in this um, and get a stable fixation. He had no restraint of valgus stress, so we fixed this with the prosthesis. You see, we, um, the nature already did his um, osteotomy. We, uh, we took it one step further, obviously, to fix the prosthesis. Depending on which prosthesis you use, there's a different set of instruments. Um, you pr always prepare the canal. In this case, you can find you in the orientation. Um, we prefer to use in stable, in, in cases like this, we prefer to use an anatomic shape, anatomical shape, radial head prosthesis. But um, in literature, there's no big difference between, um, between different uh, types of prosthesis of different brands. One thing that's very important is to look at the height of your reconstruction. Um, in this particular case, there's a, uh, there's a measurement guide, but you can use the, the trial prosthesis and then look. What we, what we do is we look at the less sigmoid notch and the trial prosthesis has to be in line with the less sigmoid notch when the forearm is in neutral. So that's the trial. You see, it's been, uh, it's been uh, 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 hit a few times, probably by me as well. Um, it's not circular in shape. This one is elliptical in shape, has a little extra C shape. There's no real anatomical name for it. Has a little extra shape here. This shape belongs to the less sigmoid notch and then the articulate dish is offset of the, uh, of the center of the head. So we, uh, we put it in. This again is the, um, is the final, uh, uh, the final uh, prosthesis. Make sure that it's press fit. What does that mean? You cannot put it in with your fingers. You just line it up and then you hit it with a hammer in order to get it in. If it's not, if you can push it in with one finger, it's gonna loosen. That's very important. And Sean O'Driscoll showed us that even if you get a little crack in the, in the radius, that's still better than to, uh, than to uh, put it in loose. So hit it in, check the orientation motion, improve stability. Uh, let's see if I can show you a nice, Still frame there, it still opens up. And I know uh, Greg Bain is listening and he, um, he and I disagree on this point. I do not fix the MCL complex. So I leave it like this. I don't uh, do an extra incision on the medial side. Uh, somehow in my hands, every time I fix it, they become, uh, patients become stiff and um, I've not had, uh, had any problems with instability post-op. So 
the radial head here offers stability to valgus stress. Um, although it still opens up, it doesn't want to dislocate anymore. If it goes through flexion and extension, it still lines up. And that would be the only indication for me to go to the medial side. If I go through flexion and extension, and when I'm going towards flex extension, it would uh, dislocate, then obviously we have to go to the medial side. It has to be stable in a range of motion from flexion to extension. If it's stable, then we don't go to the medial side and I don't routinely uh, fix it there. Clinical results are very similar between designs and good results can be found in, in 95 to, uh, uh, 75 to 95 percent of patients and um, they do well. But when we look at our, our um, or my, the, the topic of my talk, osteosynthesis versus radial head prosthesis, maybe these cases are more important. This is a clear indication for surgery, although it doesn't look too bad in, uh, in, uh, in some of the uh, images. It looks very poor here. And as you can see, this patient will not be able to rotate the forearm at all. We fix it with a low profile fixation. What does that mean? It means that I don't use any plates. Uh, we go into the neck and get a stable fixation of the fragments like that. And uh, basically what we do is we, uh, we make it into a two-part fracture. We fix the, um, um, the articulating surface fixed it with one or two screws, depending on how many we need. And then a third or a fourth screw goes into the neck to make sure that the neck is stable. This one is maybe slightly more difficult. Uh, Montagia type lesion with uh, a fractured radial head again. See, there's no doubt that this needs surgery. It's, uh, it's still dislocated even on the CT scan. Big chunk of olecranon. Unfortunately, coronal processes fractures as well. And then the radial head was smashed and I was, I was nearly 100% sure I needed to use radial head prosthesis and told the patient we were gonna do that. There you go, so it doesn't look too good on the, uh, on the CT scan. However, when we went in, we used uh, uh, adaptation of the right into the approach, which means that you get a big posterior incision. You go to the back of the, uh, of the ulna because we need a plate there anyway, and then slide off the lateral side of the ulna. Um, cut the LCR complex with or without bone, depending on what your preference is. We prefer to do this without bone. We leave it without a sleeve so we can fix it afterwards. And then it's quite easy to dislocate the elbow. We end, we, it, it's not part of my talk, but what we do then is we try to get the uh, corner process to line up. We don't fix it yet at this point. Um, we just get it lined up, fix the radial head fracture, um, reduce it and uh, then fix the coronary process. You see, I've got my transosseous sutures uh, ready for the annular, annular ligament. And then we see if it's stable or not. This was stable enough. So despite the fact that the CT scan showed comminution of the radial head and especially the radial neck, uh, we got it quite stable and, and we were able to fix the articulating surface. We used quite a lot of hardware. You see there's still a little bit of impaction on the lateral side, but we decided to to uh, accept that because of some bone loss there. And this is two weeks post-op, patients rotating and flexion extension is, is uh, very, very uh, acceptable. So uh, back to the first question, screws or prosthesis, uh, the literature, the, the, I think the most important paper was published by David Ring in 2002, and this was one that we followed for a long, long time. If there are more than three fragments, uh, uh, their patients did very poorly. So um, if they tried an osteosynthesis in patient with more than three, uh, three fragments, a very poor result. So instead of trying, use a real head for replacement. I think we've evolved a little bit with uh, respect to, um, to that. So what we do now is stable fixation still possible. So instead of deciding, okay, I'm just gonna throw this real head out and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna use a prosthesis, um, I give it a go. If stable fixation is possible with not too much hardware, we still go for an osteosynthesis. I'm sorry, the videos, I promise with my videos, I hope in the next talk it won't be. Um, but these patients do more or less the same. This is after two weeks. You see the extension flexion is nearly normal. Rotation is good. Uh, radial prosthesis in selected patients, they do very, very well as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so we'll take the, that's a good talk actually. So we'll come back to the questions after the next talk. That will be a terrible triad, demystifying the injury by Dr. Chaitanya Munkul. Hey, Roger, can you stop sharing please? Yeah, I'm trying to find the button. <laughs> Thank you.
She'll be okay now. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right. So, um, you know, that was a excellent uh, setup for this talk. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to demystify the terrible triad because it's a terrible name for an injury, which if you follow principles as outlined by David and uh, uh, Roger, uh, we can really make uh, the injury not as terrible as it seems. So whenever you try to demystify something and you try to understand something that's broken and dislocated, it is critical to understand what is normal. So the first thing to understand what is normal is the, the radial head and the proximal ulna are not coplanar if you looked at them from the side. The radial head is off-centered and it is held in place by this lateral complex, which almost behaves like a hammock. And every time you supinate, that hammock stops the radial head from rolling out. But if this complex is incompetent or torn or both, then the radial head rolls out. And that's important to understand. The second thing to understand is that Whenever people say that it's a coronoid avulsion fracture, that is a terrible choice of words. The coronoid doesn't get avulsed because there's nothing attached to the tip of the coronoid. It's intraarticular, but at the same time, you have to remember that the anteromedial complex, which is shown here by this yellow arrow, is attached way down at about 18 millimeters in most circumstances. And the brachialis also has a broad attachment much further down. So when you see an injury to this part of the coronoid, it's not an avulsion but more often a representation of a shear. So what's normal? Again, as uh, Roger pointed out, the radial head and neck are not collinear and with the shaft, there's a 15 degree angle. But more importantly, you have to remember that the radial head fractures predictably and consistently if it has a single fragment fracture. And that is in the anterolateral one third, because in the anterolateral one third, there is no thick cartilage and the subchondral support is much less. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. Now guess what? When you fall on an outstretched hand, your forearm is usually semi-pronated, and it is this anterolateral one-third that comes into contact with the capitellum and therefore fractures. So again, anatomy explains pathology, because at the end of the day, what is pathology? Pathology is anatomy gone wrong. In pronation, in addition, the same anterior third also translates uh, anteriorly on the, on the capitellum. Now, we know that the radial head is a secondary stabilizer to valgus. However, in the absence of the anteromedial collateral complex, radio capitular contact must be restored as much as possible because as you saw in Roger's cases, that even when you restore radio capitular contact, if the AMCL is incompetent, you can have a little bit of instability. So the radial head and the coronary together are your anterior buttresses against posterior displacement. And that's critical to understand. Now we know what's normal. Let's look at what's not normal. So here we have an x-ray that shows you, and there's, there's this fragment sitting here. That's your coronoid, and your radial head is completely off, and the elbow is dislocated. So there's your terrible triad. I call the coronoid the stealth fragment. As David alluded to it, it can be of different sizes. And you know, traditionally, we have had this classification of types 1, 2, and 3 based on the size. And what I find that you have to respect these fragments, because much like the stealth bomber, they are triangular in shape. You know they are there, but you can't see them. And if you disrespect them, it drops a boatload of grief on you. So to me, it's analogous to the Sigon fracture of the knee, where you have a fracture which indicates a transient instability of the joint it is associated with. Much like you have a Sigon fracture in the knee, which tells you that there's an ACL injury, therefore indicating transient instability. So also, if you have a coronoid fracture, please do not dismiss it as an avulsion or a minor fracture. It indicates that the elbow was unstable for at least a brief period of time. So type ones are not sh are sheer, they are not avulsions. And in type two, oftentimes you'll have the brachialis attached. But guess what? In terrible triads, we, although we call it a small transverse fragment, more often than not, it constitutes about 35% of the height. And therefore most of the, like we said, type twos, Reagan Mori or O'Driscoll type ones. So they, even though they may seem small, they're usually much larger than what the x-ray suggests. But here's the kicker. If you take out 30% of the coronoid and you don't repair your radial head or you excise it, even if your ligaments are intact, your elbow will still dislocate. Most radial heads in terrible triads tend to be type threes. So 
You also need to understand, we talked about the hammock, and if the hammock is incompetent, then the radial head will fall out. Now, we know that in terrible triads, the LCL avulses from the origin, giving you a ball condyle in a large percentage of cases. And what do I mean by a ball condyle? Look at this. This is uh, one of David's cases, uh, David Ring's cases, and you can see that the condyle is completely bald, and the radial head is sagging all the way back. So the radial head rolled out of the hammock because of incompetence of the posterior lateral structures. Now, plane radiographs are notoriously inadequate to assess these fractures. You need to have a CT in these cases because oftentimes the CT will tell you a story that the plane x-rays won't. For example, here's a radial head fracture and this is the capitalar piece which is wedged into the radial head. So having this information ahead of time really makes a difference to how you plan a surgical strategy. Now, what I say about the radial head and the shaft and neck not being collinear is seen here where you can see there's a 15 degree neck shaft angle. Now, more importantly, we talked about the reduction in the trabeculae in the anterolateral quadrant. And you can see this is a study by Haverstock and colleagues. And what they did was they, this green quadrant that you see here, which is the anterolateral quadrant, they did micro CTs. And the black areas show you a reduction in trabeculae as seen in these, in these pictures, which therefore means that this area which comes under impact has very poor trabecular to begin with, so it's not surprising it fractures most frequently. What we do know that is plain radiographs undercall C, undercall comminution, and the CT is invaluable. However, the inter-observer reliability of CT scan as seen in our studies is not great. So what are my goals of treatment? I believe that a stable congruent and concentric joint, even if somewhat stiff, is still, in my opinion, vastly superior to a fully mobile but unstable joint. And I'm going out on a limb here, but I do believe if you didn't have full motion, but the joint was stable, it is still better. So what do I do? A prompt close reduction. The patient must understand how bad the injury is and do not be satisfied if you have a good splint on. Redislocation can occur in a splint and I get a CT and X-rays after the reduction. I usually subtract the distal humerus to understand this better. I try to restore a stable concentric and congruous elbow and restore the anterior buttress and replace, the, uh, replace or repair the radial head to restore radiocapitular contact. Finally, I repair the lateral complex and depending on how soon or how late I've done the surgery, I will uh, consider releasing the ulnar nerve. What can be left alone? Well, Chris Fortman, one of our residents, looked at this a few years ago and what they found was repairing the medial collateral complex did not give any further advantage um, in terms of restoring stability. Uh, can you repair it? Yes, you can, but there are other ways of restoring stability rather than repairing the medial collateral complex. How about when you should do the surgery? You want to do it as soon as you can. Because look at these numbers. If you do it inside of two weeks, your flexion extension arc is 116 degrees. You do it more than three weeks, it drops by 25 degrees. Same also, the flexion contracture inside of two weeks is only 16 degrees, but the flexion contracture later is 34 degrees. And look at the drop in pronosupination from surgery done two weeks or three weeks. So therefore, the take home message is, if you do it later, you expect complications and stiffness. How do I position them? I use general anesthetic and a block usually because they go home. I supine on a hand table and I use the sterile tourniquet and I use a large bump under the elbow. I won't belabor this point, but I want you to take a few seconds to read what I keep in the operating room. And I stopped using more and more of the hinged external fixators, but I go to the static or a long plate, and I'll show you examples of those. For me, the surgical approach is a large posterior extensile surgical approach where I use uh, full thickness flaps. But once I get under the skin, I follow the coker interval. But more often than not, the injury has already made your interval for you. So you, you, know, you can debate whether you want to use the coker or the Kaplan. It doesn't matter because the injury has done all the dissection. And I proceed with my repair from deep to superficial. I then draw a line from the lateral epicondyle to crista supinatoris. And as Roger pointed out, you usually make your dissection and your, uh, arthrotomy anterior to it. And you keep the forearm pronated at all times when you're working on the radial head, like so. It allows access to the anterior portion of the radial head and capitellum. Coronoid exposure is easy and it can be extended distally by going posterior to supinator and, and pushing it forward so the PIN is completely protected. 
The coronoid fracture usually, like I said, tends to be bigger. So it's about 35% like we just reviewed it. And it does not uh, seem accessible. You have to literally stick your finger in and go anteriorly, medially, and superiorly and drag it out. I then usually use uh, number two ethabon to repair it. I find that I struggle with screws, so I don't use them anymore. And I uh, reattach it over a bony bridge, as I will show you in a minute. I pass the sutures and keep it ready. And after I've done with all my reconstruction, before I repair the lateral complex, that's when I repair the coronoid and finally repair the lateral complex. For the radial head fracture, I won't belabor this since Roger has covered this. Um, although David Ring's paper did show that if less than three fragments consider open reduction and more than three fragments consider replacement, the one feature that that paper did not look at was absence or presence of radial neck fracture. I think that makes a key determination of whether the radial head will survive or not. If the neck is fractured, essentially because of the retrograde blood supply to the radial head, that radial head is going to be dysvascular. And you saw in Roger's case, it is likely to not survive. So I inspect the capitellum, as you saw in my previous talk, in about 3% of uh, patients, you can have a capitellar injury associated with the radial head fracture. I match the size of the radial head to that of the capitellum and the coronoid, because uh, we know that the difference between the coronoid and the radial head is about 0.9 millimeters, and you don't want to overstuff it. Now, here's the one piece of advice I would share with you. If you have any concerns about the size of the radial head, go smaller. You can never go wrong going smaller, but if you go too large, you will regret it. And finally, repair everything else. So here's someone who's 66. He was reduced once, and they went home to uh, the western part of my state. He came, uh, and he came back multiple times, every time dislocating within the splint. Finally, I got to see him three weeks down the line, and here he was. The radial head is completely destroyed, although I don't have the CT to show you. It was a non-reconstructable radial head in a 66-year-old male. So here's the posterior approach, which is extensile full thickness over a large bump that you can see there. And we, the injury had already made its uh, dissection for me. So I simply extended the arthrotomy shown here, got rid of the radial head at its junction with the neck. And this is from Mike McKee's uh, cadaver dissections. And this is a beautiful depiction of how you take out the radial head. And now you're looking at the coronoid with the anterior soft tissues attached distal to the tip. So what we do here is you pass this lasso suture emerging on the fractured surface and they have to be coming out dorsally. So how do you do that? I drill two K wires, 1.6 millimeter holes to emerge on the fractured surface like you see here. And these stitches are then passed through these holes to emerge dorsally. Now you have to make sure that the bridge is at least a centimeter or it'll fracture as you tighten it. You then uh, you repair the radial head or replace it. And finally, repair your lateral complex with these suture anchors. And uh, there's his outcome at about six or eight months. Here's a 49-year-old school teacher, and the radial head is completely uh, comminuted in multiple fragments, and she had profound ulnar nerve symptoms because this fragment was actually pressing on her ulnar nerve. So here she is. You know that this is not a reconstructable radial head. So it was a no-brainer. Again, we did the same exact thing. The yellow arrow points to the pull-out stitches for the coronoid. The same method, the same technique, the same steps. So this is what I mean by demystifying the terrible triad. And finally, here she is with a reasonable outcome. How do I rehab them? I confirm wound stability first. You've got to have a stable wound. I put them in a long arm splint with the elbow at 90 and the forearm pronated to protect my lateral repair. I start pronation, so pronation with the elbow at 90 and I start flexion extension with the forearm pronated, but I give them a 45 degree stop. I don't start elbow motion until the wound has healed, which is about 10 to 12 days. I discard the splint at three weeks and increase flexion by about 10 to 15 degrees each week so that they reach complete extension by six weeks. Then I start strengthening. What happens if they come to you like this? The dislocation was reduced at an outside facility and it came to me unsplinted with active range of motion of about 90 degrees flexion but no forearm rotation, not surprisingly. So in essence, even though this was a terrible triad to begin with, the patient proved his stability because he was unsplinted. So I took the liberty of simply treating this as a radial head fracture. And there he is. To me, this was not reconstructable. I simply replaced it. And there he is six weeks post-op, and he refused to come back because he felt he was doing just fine. Is there a role for external fixation? 
Absolutely. I was called into this case, which was being taken care of by someone else, a person who fell off from about 15 feet. And what you can see is that the fracture of the radial head goes all the way past the neck and it's completely non-reconstructible, but we didn't have long radial head prosthesis. So in this situation, what I decided was that I needed an external fixator because I did not have an ability to restore radiocapitalar contact. In those days, this case is going back several years, but you have to understand that the patient has to be able to deal with an external fixator and take care of the pins and start motion while the ligaments scar at length. So here you can see how comminuted the radial neck was. And I put this hinged external fixator after putting it in the center of rotation of the articular surface um, of the joint. I pinned the DRUJ for about four weeks. You can see he's got HO where the medial collateral complex was. I repaired the lateral complex. I took off the external fixator at about eight weeks. And here he is at about 14 weeks before he went back to work. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, or maybe I'll just share one more trick with you. Here's someone who came to me. You can see this is a very large uh, lady with an elbow that's dislocated. I understand this is not a terrible triad, but a good trick to remember is that if in doubt, I have no compunction spanning the elbow with a plate, which I take off at about eight weeks, and you can still get a reasonable outcome like so. And she had full flexion, although the picture is not showing up here. So. All right, so I'm gonna stop there, guys. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaitanya. That was a very informative talk. So next, we'll be having a panel discussion on these three topics. That is uh, conoid fractures, radial head fractures, and terrible track. So we request uh, Dr. Chaitanya, Dr. Kirbid, and Roger uh, to be online. Uh, uh, Dr. Chaitanya, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Chaitanya, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, we're having some questions from the audience. <laughs> Uh, we would be happy if you could, uh, if all, it will be directed to all three of you. Yes. Uh, and secondly, because these topics intermingle, if uh, you if you have any difference of opinion, that also you could voice. Of course. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, this is a question addressed to Dr. Roger. Is there a role for isolated fragment excision? And if so, when in radial head fractures? Yes, there is. Um, if it's a small fragment that's in the way, you can resect it if it's not uh, impairing with the articulation. So um, what I tend to do is um, um, I resect a little fragment if I can't fix it. So my, my preference is still to fix it. You can have micro screws and uh, a little a little pin and you can fix it. But if the small fragment is not, is not reconstructable, not fixable, then you can remove it. Then I take the elbow through range of motion, both flexion extension, uh, pronation supination if it's not impairing with the uh, with the function of the elbow then you're fine um, i don't like uh, cookbook surgery so i don't like to say it's 25 percent or 30 percent or you know what if it's 27 or when it's, what if it's 24 you know if it impairs with the motion then i prefer uh, to reconstruct or repair uh, dr roja what exactly is the safe zone for your radial heart hardware replacement any tricks to yeah. decide on yeah. which is the safe zone intraoperatively. Yeah, that's that's a little bit less relevant for me because I don't use plates anymore. Uh, the safe zone is uh, as soon as you're under the surface of the of the of the cartilage, it's always safe. Make sure that you, that your screws are not too long so they don't impair with the less sigmoid notch on the other side of your screw. Um, but if you use a plate, uh, put the elbow in neutral. You can. Um, um, have about 90 degrees on the radial head itself, which is safe, a little bit further anterior. Um, if you look at the elbow and you look at the anatomy of the elbow, you can see that the less sigmoid notch is pointing 30 degrees um, anterolateral. And that's important. So if you take that line, 30 degrees anterolateral, 45 degrees before this line and 45 degrees behind this line are safe. So that's not necessarily on the lateral side of the elbow, which is not used, very often drawn in, in, uh, in textbooks. But if you look at the line from the less sigmoid notch perpendicular to it, you can go to the front and the back and those are both safe. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I tend to agree entirely. I've stopped using plates on the radial head for many years now. And uh, I prefer to use the construct that was seen in Roger's talk where you take a headless screw and you go obliquely. It, it looks like a stool that you use on a golf course. You know, they have the legs that go like this and uh, it's much more low profile. And uh, 
I don't use the same prosthesis that he uses. I use the Evolve prosthesis, which was designed by Graham King. And uh, he uh, published his medium term data at about eight years and his revision rates have been very, very minimal. So I'm comfortable replacing the radial head and uh, haven't regretted it. So I don't put place anymore on that area because the blood supply comes retrograde. And if you've got a radial neck fracture that's displaced, that radial head is dead as far as I'm concerned. But there's, in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, there was an interesting concept uh, which was uh, published just about, I think, six or eight months ago, where the authors essentially restored the radial head out on the table okay. and then put the radial head back as a dead piece of bone, as a spacer. And I think they promoted the formation of a pseudarthrosis. And I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, and it's reasonable to think about it if you're in a resource poor environment. But if you have the ability to put a radial head prosthesis back, I'd much rather restore radial capital or contact. Yeah, there is a, uh, another interesting question if uh, uh, you people don't mind. What exactly is SX low prestige fracture dislocation and how many times you have missed it? That is the question uh, from the audience, not from me. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, I don't know how many times I missed it. We know from the series in, uh, in, uh, at Mayo Clinic, where we looked at over 300 rail hand fractures, that, it, that the prevalence was about 15%. So probably in type 3 radial head fractures, about 15% will have a, uh, an SX lopresti injury. Um, basically, it goes back to, to uh, what I said in my talk. If, if there is longitudinal instability, you need to fix it. And uh, if you put a prosthesis in, for me, that's, that's enough. So the longitudinal stability is, is uh, reconstructed with the prosthesis. We always um, get fluoroscopy, have a look at, have a, have a quick look at the wrist, uh, at the wrist while we're pulling on the, um, on the, um, on the radial stump. I personally don't think, um, I think 15% is a little bit overestimation in my, in my uh, group, but, uh, but we treat them all. So despite the fact that maybe we missed a few, in my mind, I've treated them all. Okay. You understand the difference? Yeah. Yeah, we did get it. Um, just just add another question. Uh, in our country, sometimes it is difficult to get a good radial head prosthesis on the table. Under such circumstances, do you suggest that we uh, fix the radial head, whatever it is, and then after two or three months, go back and excise it? What is your take on that? No, um, if it's if it's if it's reconstructable, yes, reconstruct it and fix it. If it's non-reconstructable, I I think it's probably better to remove it and then take care of the soft tissues. So we know that the uh, that the medial collateral ligament is the main stabilizer for the uh, for valgus stability or valgus uh, to resist valgus instability. So if you if you don't have a real head prosthesis, I think it's fair to go to the medial side fix the medial collateral ligament, maybe even, maybe even um, strengthen the radial collateral ligament a little bit and, um, and, and go about uh, stabilizing the elbow in that way. If there's longitudinal radial ulnar instability, you need to do something about the interosseous membrane. So you either fix it or you use a graft to, um, to reconstruct it on the table. And there are some, some authors who feel that this is uh, perfectly acceptable, even if you do have a radial prosthesis in, in, you know, on the table. So, um, so if you don't have radial prosthesis, I would recommend against just sticking it in um, and fixing it at all costs. Uh, instead, I would I would resect it and and um, and take care of the soft tissues. And to go back to the to the to the other paper where they they were looking for non-union, for me that concept is completely, you know, it, it's for me that's unacceptable. If you're able to reconstruct the head, why not fix it to the neck? Yeah. You know, because in all of their cases they were able to reconstruct the head and just stuck it in. That's weird. Yeah, yeah but they're using it a, a paper. Uh, That's the only the only thing is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's an interesting concept by itself. But I think uh, sometimes what happens is when we have a lot of resources, we sometimes uh, may not understand the difficulties that people who are in resource poor environments uh, may be facing. And one of the things I've learned uh, in my travels is. Um, there are places in the world where people have used headed screws and put a blob of uh, bone cement on top of it, which then functions like a stemmed implant. And you stick the screw shaft down the radial neck, to, it behaves like an implant. I don't know what the long-term outcome is, but I've seen that being done to avoid longitudinal instability and also to restore medial lateral stability to the elbow. Is that ideal? No. 
But if you don't have anything else, what are you going to do? Now, as, uh, as we looked at it, if uh, you repair the lateral structures, okay, you can't do any of those reconstructions of the radial head. You can repair the lateral structures. You can repair the medial structures. And then if it's still unstable, you've got to put an external fixator or an internal fixator across the elbow and pin the DRUJ. I don't know that places where you don't have a radial head prosthesis, you're going to have allograft to restore your interosseous ligament anyway. It's highly unlikely that you'll have one or, one or the other. So if you don't have one, it's, highly, it's very likely you won't have the other also. So you have to make it up as you go along and there's no cookbook, so. I, I agree, but you can use triceps, uh, triceps, uh... Uh, part of the tricep, sorry, you can use palmaris, you can use hamstrings. So I'm sure that, that uh, surgeons that have to work in an environment where they don't have the luxury that we have, um, they're very resourceful and they, they, they have their little trick book as well and uh, probably have things like lots of things that we haven't even thought about and they're able to do it. So yeah. we can learn a lot from them. Oh, totally, totally. So one final question on this. Uh, is radial head excision a bad word now? No. No. So, is it always a replacement? What? How do you take it? In my hands, yes. Well, it's not a bad word. Thank you. So, um, I think that is a good segue from the original question about the SX Lopresti. And I, I'll uh, give you one study that we had done. It was a co author, it was first author was Craig Renier. And the one thing they noticed was if you had a segment of the radial head which had lost contact with the parent bone, mm -hmm. i.e. it was completely separate, then the possibility of having other injuries to that elbow was extremely high. So in those situations, if you have a fracture dislocation, I would not just excise the radial head. I would try to replace it. But if it's an isolated radial head fracture, I know that there's enough uh, data from Scandinavia to show that the long-term outcomes of radial head excision in those situations only, not fracture dislocations, is reasonable. Yeah. Um, at another question from the audience, have you ever resorted to a total elbow replacement in acute fractures? No. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll tell you why. You have to ask him. Uh, total elbow replacement has is uh, so again. Uh, there's a large uh, series out of Mayo Clinic where they did primary total elbow arthroplasties and distal humerus fractures. And if, I'm, if I recall correctly, the average uh, flexion extension arc was about 110 degrees. Correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, but uh, that was the average flexion extension arc. And uh, the complication rates in primary total elbow arthroplasty and distal humerus fractures was extremely high. So we looked at our uh, Pan Boston series as well. Um, and I think we pretty much abandoned the idea of doing primary total elbows. I have pretty much gone to doing the bag of bones. If I can't reconstruct it, I'd rather do the bag of bones and come back another time and do a total elbow in a more controlled environment. Okay, I do do total elbow replacements in acute fractures sometimes. There's a um, randomized controlled study by McKee. I know it has a lot of flaws, but there was one randomized controlled study in uh, C3 type fractures with uh, in patients over 65. And they showed that in those patients, so elderly patients with low functional uh, needs, um, they do better with the primary total elbow replacement, they have less complications. And um, what's very important for them is that they do better early. Whereas if you have a very difficult C3 type fracture in, um, I saw one of, the, one, of the, one of the questions was diabetic patients, poor skin, uh, you know, uh, patients with lots of comorbidities, then it's very useful to, uh, to just have one surgery that will probably last them a lifetime and uh, they can get going straight away. So we do, we do um, in selected patients, uh, do um, total L replacement. Although I, I totally agree that if you can fix it um, relatively easily, especially in, in patients that are active and uh, functional, um, then uh, uh, I, I believe that, the, that your own cartilage is always better. Uh, this is a question to Dr. David. Dr. David is there? Yeah. Is Dr. David available? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Coronoid fracture needs surgery. Sorry, what's that again? Does every coronoid fracture require surgical treatment? Well, uh, as, as I was presenting, um, not every coronoid fracture requires surgical treatment, and it's the context in which these coronoid fractures happen. Um, if there is a known dislocation event and after the dislocation 
the elbow fails to reduce, you're obligated to evaluate um, this coronoid fracture. There are some instances where you may get what appears to be a simple elbow dislocation with a very small flick of the coronoid. And I don't routinely scan these elbows. I see these patients in the outpatient clinic. I see whether they can range the elbow after a couple of days from the injury and whether the elbow remains stable. And these are part of the group of coronoid fractures, which are very small and don't require treatment. I believe, and it is in my practice, that many of the coronoid fractures, which are associated with the terrible triad injuries, also uh, do not routinely uh, require surgical fixation, whether it's in the form of the lasso fixation or whether it's you know uh, anchoring the capsule. However, if the CT scan does show that this is a sizable fragment, then I will um, make attempts to to stabilize it and fix it. So I I kind of make that plan straight away. Good. Uh, there is yet another question to you only. Why do some uh, terrible triads or uh, behave differently. Some have good results and some have bad results. Do you have any idea? Uh, is that for me or David? Chaitanya can take the. Or you can take the call. Any one of you. Why uh, do terrible triads behave differently from the other others? I don't think you can say that all terrible triads are the same. Um, exactly. That's what exactly. asking. So. Um, like I showed you, um, firstly, I think uh, the myth that we need to dispel that all terrible triads need surgery um, because there's there's some a small series of four and six cases where terrible triads have been treated non-operatively in certain situations. So that's the first thing. The second thing is some terrible triads uh, don't have the degree of soft tissue injury as much as others, so they certainly behave much better. But in insofar as the components of the injury are concerned, they are the same. It's just the extent of the injury that decides how they behave. Comorbidities make a difference. Age makes a difference. Um, so I, I, that's why I don't think you can just lump them all together. Yeah. Dr. Chaitanya, yes. there's one question from the audience. In the repair of the terrible trial, what is the order in which the surgical correction is done? So it's always deep to superficial. General... I, yeah, it's deep to superficial. Okay. I uh, address the coronoid first, and I keep everything ready for for uh, uh, repairing it at the end. Okay. Um, and you know, uh, then I address the radial head, which is usually replaced for me mm -hmm. because it's type three most of the time. Okay. Uh, after I replace the radial head, then I will uh, tie the coronoid down, and final step would be to repair the lateral complex. Would you advocate the anterior approach to the coronoid at any time? You know, I, I, I'm not going to say never and always. I've never done it. That's all it is. Uh, but I, you know, if I need to, I might, I guess. So I know. Um, so it's funny you should ask that because uh, I have some colleagues in China yeah. who routinely approach the large coronoid fragments through the anterior approach. So okay. I haven't done it that way. Now, two final questions. Uh, one is addressed to Dr. David. Where does he aspirate? What is the point of aspiration? Landmark. Landmark for aspiration in radial uh, head fractures, one. And the second question is, how much of the radial neck you should keep when you exercise the radial head? That's for me. So um, landmarks for uh, for aspiration is very easy. So you get the lateral condyle, um, the radial head, and the tip of the olecranon. They they form a triangle, and it's the center of the triangle. And very important when you're placing a needle into the into the soft spot is to make sure that the needle is perpendicular to the skin, because um, when you just aim it in any direction, you'll hit you'll hit the bone, either the radial head or the capitella. Uh, cartilage. So aim it in, in the uh, perpendicular to the skin. Basically go in, aspirate. When the blood comes out, um, patients will feel very, very relieved. And um, if, you don't, if you can't get the blood out, either 
make sure that your needle is in the right spot or, or uh, put a little bit of air into the joint because sometimes you'll, you'll end up sucking up some, uh, some harder tissue or, or maybe some synovia, which is very painful. If you just put a little bit of air and clean your, um, clean your needle, then the fluid will come out. Then uh, with regards to the radial neck, that depends on your fracture and it depends on the, um, on the um, prosthesis that you use. So uh, depending on the prosthesis that you use, you need to resect more or less of the radial neck. Um, we, we aim the height at the lesser sigmoid notch. Like I said, the lesser sigmoid notch is always there. So some uh, surgeons prefer to uh, reduce the elbow and then look at the height with respect to the capitellum. However, for me, there's too much um, going on there. So what we do is we, we resect whatever fragments of radial head are, are left. We look at the, at the top, the most proximal part of the less sigmoid notch. And we know that when the forearm is in neutral, it's flush with that. If you're not 100% sure and you're in a little bit of doubt, it's better to lower the prosthesis a little bit instead of overstuffing. I think this question was uh, not for replacement purposes, but for excision of the radial head. Because most, most people wow. in India try to excise the radial head. So they would like to know how much of the radial neck you, sh you should keep or you should take away. I definitely don't have a lot of experience, but I would say as little as possible. Thank Protect you. as little as possible. Okay. So uh, thank you. We thank you very much. We thank you very much for your uh, extensive uh, uh, and detailed uh, analysis. And I hope our audience also has uh, learned a lot from you. We really wish to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Avinash, you're not audible. Thank you. Uh, so this presentation is on uh, elbow instability. I hope you have a clear view of my screen there. Um, so this present, so I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to provide this presentation. Um, it's nice to see Roger again. Roger, we, we had a pleasure of having Roger with us some years ago. So with regard to the anatomy around the elbow, I think everyone in this group is familiar with the importance of the medial and lateral ligament complexes and also the uh, coronoid process uh, anteriorly, which is the main buttress. Uh, with regard to uh, recent times, we've published this book and Roger was one of the co-editors with us on uh, with regard to the sports related injuries of the elbow and it's a, a book that you may find of interest to you that uh, I think it covers nicely all of the surgical concepts with regard to the different options. The, um, with looking at the, uh, the stability of the elbow, if we look at the top left image, we can see the trochlear in the radial head and that we can see in the bottom image how the, uh, the whole construct works together and how the ligaments join together at the epicondyles so that on the medial and lateral sides, we have an anterior complex and posterior complex of ligaments that provide the stability to the elbow joint. And uh, the uh, all joints have six degrees of freedom. And we can see here how we've got this uh, uh, varus and valgus and supination, flexion, and extension. Oh, hello. The uh, oh. ligament restraints uh, on the medial and lateral sides, uh, we have again anteriorly and posteriorly. These all provide restraints uh, for the uh, proximal humerus to, to, to control the position of the proximal humerus throughout the range of motion. Thank you so much. If we look at arthroscopy in the anterior compartment and we look at the coronoid process, we can get a best view of that and assess it with various. Yeah, if, if some of the other people can mute their microphone, please. Yeah. Um, looking at the, uh, from the posterior aspect of the elbow 
And if we place a pronation or supination force, we can see how the, the, this will close or open the posterior aspect of the elbow. So anteriorly, we can see um, varus and valgus. Posteriorly, we can see the rotation of the ulna. So if there's a forced supination force on the elbow, we're going to get a rupture of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. We're going to get a fracture of the, uh, the tip of the coronoid process, and we may get an impaction fracture of the radial head. From the previous presentations, we've got a better understanding of the importance of the coronoid process, but this is the, the sort of classic uh, concepts that occur with a forced supination injury. It's now, um, it's 55 years or so since uh, the concept of Osborne and Cottrell, where they described the essential lesion on the, uh, on the lateral side of the elbow, which is an avulsion of the lateral ligament complex. And we've heard the other authors talk about this bare area or the bare head on the lateral side. Um, I just want to highlight as well uh, that he also pointed out on the medial side that there was often an attenuation of the medial ligament complex uh, at that time. If we go on to the Mayo Clinic, and the Mayo Clinic have made uh, many contributions in this area. They uh, highlighted the importance of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, the circle of Hori, which is that diagram in the, in the, in the bottom uh, image there, which demonstrates that tearing from the lateral side. They described the provocation test and they described an isometric anatomic extra articular reconstruction. So when we see our patients um, and we're looking at instability, there's, there's many ways that we can assess these patients. Probably the most important one is the clinical assessment of the clinical examination, because instability is about how the joint responds to a stress force placed on it. Does it uh, dislocate or does it subluxate? So we can see on the top right, you've got this um, uh, 3D CT scan. So this gives us a beautiful understanding of the coronoid process we can see the fluoroscopic view where we can see this abnormal widening on the medial side. We can see arthroscopy and an MRI scan. And historically, or in my practice, I've not used the MRI a lot, but we can see here there's clearly an abnormal joint space widening, and we can also see these ligament tears. So I think in the future, MRI scan will be used a little bit more often than it has been in the past. So once we've uh, decided that if we need to do surgery and if we're going to the lateral side, uh, we um, previously, one of the presenters spoke about making an incision anterior to the lateral on a collateral ligament. We would tend to make that as a, as a Z cut so that we're able to always identify and close the, uh, the lateral capsular structures. Uh, however, often in these patients with an acute injury, this entire ligament complex uh, on the medial and or lateral sides will be ruptured. And in fact, often the muscular wad is also ruptured, particularly if the elbow is unstable on clinical examination. So if we uh, get into the lateral side of the elbow and uh, Roger and the other presenters described very nicely about the radial head fractures and we agree with the concepts of trying to uh, anatomically reconstruct the radial head if possible. And uh, we also agree that we should try and if we can't do that uh, radial head replacement. The other point is that um, if the bone is particularly soft, is that the, it's important that the, the, it's more important that the elbow is stable than actually even the radial head. So the radial head, it's cup shape, uh, does provide some stability to the lateral side of the elbow and does help contain it on the capitellum. So it, if you can't actually contain the radial head on the capitellum, then I think you should be removing it and replacing it. So um, Roger's already spoken about these tests and so uh, they the, were part of my presentation, so I've kept them in there, but basically uh, cock a clamp on the radial head, looking for two millimeters of proximal and distal translation for the Essex lepresti, and by placing a, a valgus force on the elbow to seeing if there's an abnormal uh, narrowing on the, between the radial neck and the capitellum. So in this case, it didn't narrow right down, but if you put it into valgus, and it really closes right down, then that would uh, demonstrate the medial side's abnormal. And also, what I think it was Roger demonstrated, you can do that with fluoroscopy. So you can do it with fluoroscopy or with what I've just shown you there. So usually these cases will have a tip avulsion or the, the superior uh, 20 or 30% as demonstrated in this terrible triad. 
And this is particularly with the supination type injuries. And the mechanisms of injury is usually a, a posterior lateral rotatory instability with these type of injuries. If the patient has a radial head that we've got extensive uh, comminution or we're able to get right through from the lateral side of the coronoid process, uh, particularly if the radial head's going to be excised, then we can stabilise this. And we can see a large AO bone holding clamp which has been applied here. And hopefully this video will work. It just demonstrates in this cadaveric model that we're able to stabilise this uh, coronoid process. And uh, we can see that if we let that go, we can see that the coronoid process is now mobile, but we can see how by making this approach more proximal, more of like a column type release, that we're able to get a much better exposure of going across to the medial side. But I will highlight that if you're doing this extra exposure, it's critical that you stabilize this entire lateral complex as part of the procedure. It would certainly be a mistake to perform this extra release and not get good stability of the coronoid process. So we can see that these screws are being able to be placed into position. We can see the joint is being subluxated and this was held with the AO clamp. So we can see that we're able to get good stability. And again, we agree with the previous presenters about trying to hold this together with interfragmentary screws if we can. And if you look carefully, these type of screws can be inset into the articular surface so that they uh, have a wider footprint. I think these are actually a little bit more stable than the headless compression screws. So we're tending to use these uh, flat type head screws and putting them right into the subchondral bone plate. So with regard to the repair of the techniques, in fact, Osborne and Cottrell described this over 50 years ago using grasping sutures and advancing this up onto the epicondyle to repair the lateral ligament complex. And the results of this in acute and chronic uh, can be good. Uh, the, in the chronic situation, if there's extensive uh, attenuation and, and some tissue loss on the lateral side, then a ligament reconstruction would be required. So we can see here that the, the radial head and this now needs to be stabilised. So I'm now going to go and talk a little bit about uh, posterior lateral rotatory instability. So this is a chronic case. A patient has recurrent episodes of instability and we can see that the radial head will subluxate in this um, provocation test with supination extension and a slight valgus force. And we can see the radial head is pushing off the back of the capitellum. We get this characteristic dimple that we see uh, when we're examining the elbow uh, in, in, in the clinical situation. This particular example was done on the patient under general anaesthetic, which is the easiest way to do it. But in the clinic, you can attempt to do this manoeuvre, but the patient who has instability won't usually like that. You can do use fluoroscopy to try and highlight if there's any um, subluxation, and you can put local anaesthetic in there as well into the joint, which will take away some of their proprioceptive reflex to see if, the, if this, their joint will subluxate. However, it's important to point out that you really don't want to be dislocating the elbow joint in the clinic. They might not be so impressed with that. But the technique of using fluoroscopy and local anaesthetic does make it easy to examine these patients. But as we know in the shoulder, uh, in the shoulder, the patient will have an apprehension when they have an instability. So when you're attempting to perform this type of manoeuvre, if the patient has an apprehension sign, that that's likely to be uh, demonstrate that they've got some subluxation. So from uh, an arthroscopic point of view, there are some subtle signs that have been described. This was described by Buddy Savoir where the, there's the loose annular ligament and the exposed uh, radial head. Uh, there can be an attenuation when you're trying to grasp that, which uh, Paulo has described. Also, that there can be the articular cartilage, which way off the head, uh, down along the neck, can be identified, and that the whole collar can be loose. So these sort of subtle signs may be of some value in helping us understand how to manage some of these cases and identify these subtle changes of instability. Increasingly now, we're trying to use dry arthroscopy as demonstrated here. And so with the dry arthroscopy, there's very little salon inside the joint. And we can see that we get a better depth of field. We're able to see the uh, fine perfusion within the joint because the fluid pressure is not closing it down. And even these fine folds in the captured tissues, we can identify. And part of the reason why we can get a better depth of field is because the synovial fluid on the joint will tend to reflect 
Whereas uh, if you've got the, the Ceylon in there, you won't actually get that reflection. Also, I think we do get some better understanding of the true anatomy. We get some better understanding of the true instability uh, of the joint uh, at the time of uh, arthroscopic assessment. Now, there's been a number of techniques described on how to arthroscopically stabilize them. And Rogers developed a technique, and I, I won't demonstrate or show his technique because I think he'll put it in his talk shortly. Uh, but basically, there's a number of techniques. And I consider that these are all advanced techniques. And uh, I'm not going to go into them in detail, except to say I think they are available for those of you who are interested. And, and certainly the book that we put together does cover a number of these. So when we go into looking at posterior lateral rotator instability, this was a case that presented to me many years ago. And we can see we've put it in from the back. We've got this drive through sign. and We've got this extensive rent on the lateral capsule. And so in this particular case, I managed this with an open technique because there was, I thought there was uh, more than subtle instability, there was gross instability. And we can see in this case of mine on the left, how the image looks remarkably similar to that uh, diagram uh, drawn by Osborne and Cottrell over 50 years ago. And if you put a brattle into the proximal ulna, we can see the whole ulna's flicking around. It's the ulna that's unstable and the radius follows this ulna through this instability uh, arc. So that's the ulna that's unstable. So we, I think we know the anatomy with the lateral ulna collateral ligament, the radial collateral ligament, and also the annular ligament, but they're often pulled off as an entire sleeve. Uh, if there is a significant disruption of the soft tissues and we can't just repair it, then we think we should be using a reconstruction. There are many techniques described in the literature and this is the one that we prefer. We place a drill hole through the center of rotation or slightly proximal to it. And we drill those both proximally and posteriorly. We use a, a, a proper tendon graft. We've previously might have used the palmaris longus, but if it's more than you know, if it's not a, a sizable uh, palmaris, we would tend to use a hamstring tendon, uh, maybe a gracilis, and put an interference fit screw here, and then interference fit screws distally as well. We've found that this creates a very robust reconstruction of the lateral ligament complex. Just to show this in this model, we can see how by using this technique, passing it through, interference fit screw here, and then interference fit screws into the ulna as well, so you can see that the exposure is a little bit bigger on, on from the lateral side to be able to pass this drill hole through from the footprints through to the posterior um, dorsal aspect of the proximal ulna. But with three interference fit screws, it's a strong construct. And um, we can also see that there are these capsule applications that provide extra support. So, so why make it in this construct? Well, the reason that we do it this way is we know that the primary source of failure is proximally. So we wanna make this optimal fixation. So this isn't going to fail at this area. Theoretically, I suppose the whole lateral condyle could fracture, we've never seen that, but uh, we think that this is a much stronger construct. So this whole concept of how the lateral capsule peels off and how it's not just the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, but how this whole lateral side occurs and its failure to heal is uh, what we would refer to as the lateral sided theory of elbow instability. So th this is a concept that uh, a lot of people have been considering, and I think the Mayo Clinic have led this charge uh, for some time. So the lateral sided theory of elbow instability. But really, elbow instability is not just about the lateral side. And if we have a forced pronation, and maybe a varus force, we get this valgus impaction fracture here, we get an avulsion of the medial collateral ligament, the, the true lateral ligament gets avulsed as well in a sleeve type injury, and the radial head's intact. So really one of the things I really wanna highlight, and the alarm bell should be ringing, if the radial head's intact and the elbow looks a bit unstable, it's grinding and it's swollen, really maybe you've got posterior lateral rotary instability. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Adam Watts, uh, who's also a fellow as well of ours. We can see that he, hi he highlighted the concept of that the whole, or a lot of the instabilities are not from the lateral side primarily, but often it starts on the medial side and it progresses to the lateral side. So there is a spectrum of instability. It can be medial or lateral, but uh, it's probably more likely that it's starting on the medial side. 
And uh, this is some cadaveric arthroscopy. In fact, Roger, I think, helped me with these. You can see this is a normal cadaver taken through a range of motion, and it should get an opening of about one millimeter, would, would be a normal finding. And we can see at the back here that maybe it opens up a bit more than a millimeter on the posterior aspect of the elbow, and maybe the probe can be admitted into this interval. If we go now to dividing the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament, we can see that the elbow will open about three or four millimeters with just the division of only the anterior bundle. And then if we open the posterior bundle as well, so division of the anterior and posterior bundles, we can see this entire uh, medial side of the elbow would open up. So Roger made the comment before about if there's a radial head fracture. So if there's a radial head fracture and the anterior and posterior bundles are torn, we would recommend repairing it. But you can see here, if it's just the anterior bundle, the joint's not going to dislocate. It will just tend to open a bit. And that one doesn't, in my opinion, need stabilizing. But if the whole side is opening up, uh, despite fixing of the radial head, then I think you should stabilize the medial side. So these, this, this uh, has already been presented about the importance of uh, this medial facet. Uh, and the sub sublime uh, tubercle and its importance with regard to the stability. Uh, we can see here again how this opening between the capitellum and the radial head and that the radial head is not fractured. Please, this is ringing alarm bells as posterior and medial rotatory instability and then maybe this shearing fracture or impaction fracture on the medial side. This is just another example of that. So if we have a patient who has a coronoid process fracture uh, and there may be an instability, it, it, it's often that they have this type of injury where the coronoid process is avulsed and the anterior, or, sorry, anterior capsule and the anterior bundle of the MCL may be torn. And this injury or zone of injury is often between the anterior bundle and the posterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament. And so that it's a disruption in what we refer to Z tearing of the ligaments. So the ligaments will tend to tear from one attachment, go between the ligaments and then to the other attachment. So some of these uh, coronoid process fractures can be managed with arthroscopic techniques, but I, I think if you're not a very experienced arthroscopist, then I think you should be avoiding it. And it may just be that arthroscopy helps in you understanding and assessing some of these patients. We've already heard about a number of the different uh, treatment options to be able to stabilize these. And I think some of these can be quite difficult. We've already seen about this uh, suture technique as well. Um, increasingly though, we tend to try and stabilize particularly the larger fragments with an anterior plate. And this can be put in an over the top technique or by uh, splitting the FCU tendon or muscle and getting exposure onto the uh, anterior medial side. And this uh, uh, plate was designed by Adam Watts, uh, I think uh, sold by Medardis. So if we then go to the medial side and we look at the soft tissue injuries that occur, and this is a patient who had a subacute presentation to their elbow dislocation. We can see the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament has been evolved from the uh, medial epicondyle. We can see the ulnar nerve, of course. Um, so in some of these cases, particularly when this anterior bundle will tend to shorten up and um, it, it may, not all, may not always heal into this position, if, particularly if there's a subluxation of the joint. So if there's a persistent subluxation of the joint, that is of concern. And it's not the same as the knee because the knee, the MCL has an extensive attachment on the medial side of the knee and the, on the elbow, this has a smaller attachment to the epicondyle into this area here, which we can see with the arrows. So we have the anterior bundle and the posterior bundle. So the anterior bundle is for valgus. The posterior bundle is the primary stabilizer against the pronation force. So if we've opened the medial side and we've stabilized, got everything ready on the lateral side to be, to be put together, and then we put everything ready to go on the medial side, and we call this prefabricated so that Everything's been effectively ready to be closed and then we close the medial side and then we close the lateral side and then that's it. So, and if the coronoid process is involved as well, we'd probably do that first. So we'd probably coronoid process, medial side and the lateral side and then have everything stabilized. So this whole concept we refer to as the medial side of the theory of elbow instability. So the video I showed you before of that case, I cut it short 
this is actually a bit more of that same case, but this was an important case in my evolution of understanding of the elbow. I showed you the rent on the, on the lateral side. And then when I passed the scope to the medial side, the whole medial side of the elbow was open. I got the most beautiful view of the bare area and I can get right across to the medial side of the elbow. So this is actually not just posterior lateral rotator instability. This is a more complex instability. This is a combined medial and lateral sided instability. And so instability, we shouldn't just be thinking it's medial or shouldn't just be thinking it's lateral. We have to understand the pathoanatomy of the entire injury and relate it to what's going on with the, the entire complex. And in some of these cases, we might look at doing a circumferential graph and, and Roger uh, wrote this up for me some years ago. And this is using a hamstring tendon graph where we place a hamstring through the center of rotation of the humerus and the sublime and um, supernatal crest and put multiple um, interference fit screws. So this stabilizes the medial and lateral sides. It is important that you actually fill all these uh, interference fit screw spots because there can be some translation or almost like a bungee cord concept of the tendon in the particular in the humerus. So if I have time still, I will show a couple of cases. If we're short on time, I'll, I'm happy to close off. But this is a patient who's 21 years of age who had a football celebration and he had a um, initially dislocation of the elbow, was put back. He represents uh, after eight weeks after he's had a further fall with this persistent uh, elbow dislocation. We opened this up with our posterior approach, worked each side of the triceps tendon, we cleaned it out. We talked before about the bare area on the lateral side, we've got a bare area on the medial side as well. So this is a bit of a tricky problem. And uh, in the past, we've looked at using external fixateurs, which I, I might say we use a lot less of now. I only use these in complex uh, compound injuries now. But what we're tending to use for these injuries is an internal fixateur or internal joint stabilizer. This was developed by George Orbe, and it's got a central center of rotation pin that goes through the axis of rotation of the humerus. It's got an articulated arm that comes down to a little plate, and then this stabilizes on the ulna, and this creates a fixed length that stabilizes the whole lateral side of the elbow. It's put in, as we see here, with the axis pin going through the center of rotation, and I see it there as well. And we can see the plate on the proximal ulna. It's got a few little jig systems that go with it that I won't have time to explain. But this is a, a clinical case of mine. And we can see at the end of the procedure, the entire lateral complex has been stabilized with this device. So I've done all the formal repairs like any of the other presenters have advised us. I've stabilized that. And then I've put this device on. So what this enables me to do in this complex case is to get this patient moving pretty well the next day. Uh, it's all, all the suturing of the skin is just performed. The patient then gets it moving and the frame's often removed after about three months. So in summary, we've covered a number of the anatomical points uh, that are critical to stabilize the elbow. And we've looked at some of the concepts of, uh, of surgery, of using uh, tendon sutures, uh, sutures and uh, tendon grafts. So I hope that's been of some interest to, to the group and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. It was a great talk. Now we'll ask the panelists to discuss some questions. That was an excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Bain. It was a good spectrum, even though uh, in our country we come across the many other it's what you described, especially the external fixator and other things. A couple of questions. One is, um, so how do we proceed in a primarily presenting instability of the elbow? For example, there is an outstretched hand fall injury um, uh, with a varus strain. So immediately the patient, when we see, how do we proceed with that? Patient? So um, firstly, the majority of... Um, Elbow dislocations do not need surgery. So we would, would assess the patient, uh, we would examine them, and what I like to do is try to divide it into one of two groups. It's either a standard dislocation where the patient has some swelling, uh, but they're able to sort of move the elbow, 
or whether this is like what I refer to as an industrial type injury. So the industrial type injury, the entire elbow is swollen. There may be a lot of bruising. The patient will have a lot of pain and it might be a significant mechanism of injury. I would look for, as the previous presenters described, about the signs of Essex lepresti. And if, it's, if the elbow is, um, is just moving, it is, is tending to subluxate and the patient's having a lot of pain, then I might do a fluoroscopic examination. If there's any fractures at all, then I might do a CT scan. And in those cases where it's grossly swollen, uh, I may take the patient to the operating theatre to do an examination under anaesthetic. And for some of those, I would, off, I would probably uh, perform an arthroscopy. To be honest with you, the, the information I've learned over the years of doing, of really trying to hone down exactly what's going on with this pathoanatomy, I think has really helped me understand some of these more complex cases and go back and look at, is it a valgus, varus, posterior medial, posterior lateral instability, and do all of those clinical tests in the operating theatre, just like you would do if you were examining a patient in the clinic and do that with fluoroscopy. And all of those tests can actually be applied in, at the time of uh, having the arthroscope inside the joint as well. I can't hear you. Prof, I have a question. So, irrespective of how good your uh, repair or reconstruction is, on the radiograph, you always see a humoral ulnar lag. So, what does it mean? Here? Does it mean that the uh, repair is not done well, or is it normal to have that? Uh, Prof, did you get my question? Yeah. Prof, Can you right? repeat the question? Yes. Uh, Prof, irrespective of how good uh, you repair the ligaments or reconstruct the ligaments, there's always a humoro ulnar lag on the x-rays. So uh, is it, does it mean that the repair is not good or is it normal? That, that, that's a good point. Um, the, uh, when we try and bring the capsule ligaments back up, um, we, we repair them and you know, we sort of think we're not too bad, but really we're not that super good. <laughs> um, we can grasp the ten or grasp the ligaments and bring them up, but there's always going to be a bit of a sag just because there's just the way that we stitch things. We just don't get it tight enough. Um, so in, in fact, I've tended to make sure I try and repair any ligaments that are all, so that's why you know, Roger made the comment before that I tend to probably repair the medial side more than some other people. And the reason why I've done that is to try and make sure that if, if it is opening up, then I do do repair it. And if the lateral side, I make sure I repair that as well. So if you look at your lateral x-ray and you get a, a sag sign or it tends to just open up, that's demonstrating that there's often a posterior lateral rotatory instability. It doesn't necessarily mean the patient needs further surgery. And, and uh, one of the rehab things that's probably quite important is the concept of having the arm above the head and trying to extend the elbow above the head. So even if there is a little bit of subtle instability there, the patient will then tend to self-correct with the triceps and the, the biceps will tend to bring that, that elbow, elbow joint together. The next thing is with instabilities, obviously supination, pronation is important. So at the time of completing the repair, you should get, examine the elbow and make sure you understand whether the elbow is more unstable in supination or pronation, or if it's more unstable being in extension so that you understand exactly what will make the elbow be threatened and make sure you immobilize it in that position. What's the role of the MRI? scan in this diagnosis because most of the ligament injury is the knee joint. We primarily depend on the MRI scans. So is it the same thing in elbow injuries or is it the clinical examination which is more important? Um, I've, I've tended to use the clinical examination and uh, certainly if there's a coronary process, I would tend to go towards the, uh, the 3D CT scan like the previous presenters. If it's a simple dislocation, then I'd I don't, I wouldn't be doing an MRI, but if it's as complex uh, factors involved, then I, I may do an MRI scan. But I, I wouldn't be doing an MRI scan as often as say some of the knee surgeons I expect. 
One of the other presenters might wish to comment on that. Roger, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I agree. I don't do MRIs that often. I, I know in Germany we um, um, we have a lot of discussion with the, with the, with the German surgeons because they get an MRI always and um, base their um, surgery on the MRI. And I feel if you see those MRIs, they, they it's it's a mess. It it looks like it like everything is torn. It's very easy to convince a patient they need surgery, even in a simple dislocation. I think that Roger's right. There's the imaging of on the MRI is quite scary. It's uh, it can be extensive, so it, it's more important about the instability than the actual findings on the MRI. I agree. Although Adam Watts is working on it, um, and they looked at uh, the flexor pronator group being torn as well, and it seems that the in their uh, series, the people that had a torn flexor pronator group in the MRI uh, needed surgery on the medial side as well. So there are. As you know, Adam is very uh, academic and he's, he's really looking at it in depth. And uh, when they will come out with those with that data, I'm sure it will be, uh, be conclusive and it will probably change my mind for MRIs, I think. I'm not sure yet. The, um, there was an important paper, I think, from Josephson. It was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was literally like 1990, um, somewhere there, 1995, I'm not sure exactly the year. And what they did was that they half the patients got surgery and half didn't. But what they found was that when they gave those gave them a general anaesthetic, they did an EUA. And what they found was that the patients who had a tear of the medial side of that muscular wad, just like Roger described, those patients they were able to simply dislocate on the table. So I think the way it works is that the collateral ligament is the primary restraint for the st stability of the elbow. And the secondary restraint is the muscular wad. So if you tear the primary restraint, there is a little bit of stability from the muscles. But if you tear the muscles as well, then the elbow is just going to dislocate straight away. Dr. Bain, you showed one uh, picture showing uh, both the reconstruction of the medial and lateral uh, ligament complex with one ligament all around. Uh, is it the same uh, procedure defined or described for the uh, rotational instability, multi-directional, multi-direction instability of the elbow? What do you, how do you um, multi-directional instabilities? So, uh, it, well, it is a multi-directional instability of the elbow. Um, Roger and I wrote that up in about 2006, I think. And so it, we used it really only for patients who had medial and lateral instabilities. And in fact, that case I showed you, that arthroscopy, I, I clearly remember doing that case and I, I wasn't sure because no one was doing medial and laterals back then that, that I knew of anyway. And then, so I did the lateral side like we all did. And then I, he, the patient was just, had some subtle instabilities and I wasn't really happy about it. And I went back and looked at my videos and I thought <laughs> I need to repair the medial side. So that's when we developed that. And um, Roger also wrote up, for us a case, I think of a 13 year old patient who had um, instability as well. And I was quite worried about that patient at that age with growth plates and things. Um, but we left it as long as we could and it stabilized really quite well on the medial and lateral sides. But I do stress again, you should put a interference fit screw on the medial and lateral sides of the humerus. Roger, do you want to comment any more about that technique? Yes, I, I want to add that um, uh, Michael Hackel and um Last Peter Müller's group from Cologne in Germany, they looked at this biomechanically and they looked at, uh, uh, at the obvious basically doing a circumferential graft and looking at a separate uh, repair or reconstruction of the, on the medial and lateral side. So separate MCL reconstruction, separate LCL reconstruction. And they found at least in their cadaveric studies that the, the uh, circumferential graft was more stable. So uh, it did better. And um, I thought about, you know, why, why would it do better? Because it's it, it's supposed to do the same, I guess. But uh, one of the biggest advantages uh, I've found with, uh, with using your technique is uh, um, it's very easy to find the, um, the origin and insertions. And as soon as you have the origins and insertions perfect, that's probably the reason why, why, why it works so well. So you drill a um, very diagonal hole in the ulna and almost a transverse hole in the, in the humerus, get your graft in, um, on the medial side, you get a really nice um, uh, reconstruction because you only need one or maybe two strands, depending if you do if you do a separate uh, posterior band as well. Um, 
the one strand, which is nice and lean. It doesn't impair, um, or it doesn't interfere with the ulnar nerve. It doesn't interfere with the muscles. And then on the lateral side, you can get a big chunk of, uh, of biological tissue. So that may be the reason why it's, why it's doing well, because of the leanness of the repair on the medial side and then the, the chunk of, uh, of tissue on the lateral side. But I'm not 100% sure, but it was better in, in their series, biomechanical um, research in the lab. So day one, not uh, looking at healing, it was more stable. Thank you. That was a nice discussion on that. Uh, Clement, do you have any comments? Any any points you want to raise? Yeah. Ruben? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, Ben. Yeah. So in isolated uh, ultralateral instability, so what uh, portals do you use as the viewers and the working portal? Posterior lateral rotator instability. Yeah, yeah. But if, if I was doing that, I'd still just use my standard arthroscopic portals. Um, okay. In my practice, I tend to still go to the ligament repair or ligament graft. So I would do my scope and pretty well as I showed you there before. And then if but there is a place to stabilize the, the anterior capsular structures and put them back to the epicondyle, and uh, Buddy Savoy is probably the one who's popularized that initially. Roger's got a nice technique where it's probably more of a plication, but I think he's got a lecture coming up shortly where he, I'm Absolutely, sure he'll yeah. describe that. And yeah. um, so, but I think if the patient's got recurrent dislocations, in my practice, I would do an open approach to that. And then, then I would go ahead and, and do the repair or reconstruction, uh, basically, as I showed you. Yeah. There is a question. Uh, there was a case for somebody from the audience that uh, they had a case of simple elbow instability without a fracture. And after two months uh, after putting in a cast, they opened it and they had to do a medial and lateral ligamentary complex, uh, complex repair. But still it was unstable. So when they removed the external fixator, still it was unstable. So what do you suggest? That's the question from the audience. Yes, so that's that's an extremely difficult scenario. Um, I really think it comes back to the what is actually unstable. So uh, it's probably the coronoid process uh, fracture that was, as was said before, like it's often bigger than you first think. So the elbow hasn't been primarily stabilised. So, so I think that's the key point to get that right and get all the ligament attachments right. So the fixateur isn't the answer. It, it's it's an adjunct. So even when we put that internal joint stabilizer on, the point that I really wanted to stress was that all the ligament repairs still have to be done. The coronoid still has to be respected, um, and all those things still need to be stabilized. And then the the internal external fixateur is just a supplement. It's just a neutralization device to hold the joint in place once you've primarily stabilized it. Thank you, uh, Ed Bain. Can we move on to the next talk by Roger Rayad on elbow arthroscopy, portal arthroscopic anatomy and the advantages? Yes. Thank you for sharing the screen. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, elbow arthroscopy. I was talked. I was. Um, I was instructed to talk about the basics of uh, elbow arthroscopy. We do. We will hint about a hint on uh, on our technique of uh, LCR reconstruction, but. You know, I'll be happy to come to India next year to uh, to explain it to you myself, and uh, uh, make a make a nice holiday of it. Let's see if I can forward. So again, consult with Akimet and designer of uh, of, of a brace uh, with Jake design. Uh, but my biggest disclosure, and especially for this talk, is uh, that I'm uh, uh, one of Greg's uh, previous fellows in 2006. He remembered uh, correctly. Um, everything that I know about uh, elbow arthroscopy. Um, um, is from him, and um, maybe we uh, we were able to um, to deepen up some of his concepts. But uh, definitely, the basis was uh, was in 2006 in in Adelaide. Um, I learned to respect the elbow. I learned to respect the arthroscopy, and uh, I learned to think um, a little bit more like him. Although when you see Greg doing arthroscopy, it always looks very very easy. So what is arthroscopy? Arthroscopy is keyhole surgery. And uh, keyhole surgery means that you want to see the big picture through this little keyhole. 
And that's not always very easy because you, you never know what hides behind that keyhole. However, if you can't see the big picture, it's probably better to make an incision. It's potentially dangerous. Nerve injury, up to 1% in, uh, in relatively experienced hands, published in arthroscopy in 2016. And what can we injure? We can injure on the medial side. Uh, obviously, we're afraid of the ulnar nerve. The medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve um, is annoying when you do something there, but obviously, if you, if you um, uh, damage the ulnar nerve, that's way worse for the patient. Um, on the lateral side, we have a lot of respect for the radial nerve. And as you can see from this drawing from, uh, from Greg's book that he alluded to earlier, uh, the more distal you go with your uh, lateral portals, the more likely you are to uh, run into the, um, either the posterior interosseous nerve or even the radial nerve if it hasn't um, split by then. So in this video, we'll go over uh, the portals that we make. Um, I always, always start with um, palpating the ulnar nerve and I draw it. We draw, then draw the lateral side of the olecranon. I don't do an extensive drawing like this in all patients, but just for, the, for this video, yes. Uh, this is a triangle I talked about earlier when you aspirate the joint. Well, this is also the triangle where you can insufflate the joint and put some fluid in. You can use an air arthroscopy like, uh, like Greg taught you, but uh, uh, told you um, we do this routinely in, uh, in many patients, but still um, I think the, the standard way of doing it is still uh, fluid uh, um, insufflation. Medial epicondyl, stay in front of the epicondyl, about two centimeters proximal, one centimeter anterior. I tell my, my uh, residents and fellows, do not, do not uh, try and touch the uh, intermuscular septum with your uh, cannula. I, I had at least one patient with a neuropraxia where I'm pretty sure but that the uh, ulnar nerve was touched when the, when the, when the fellow tried to, um, uh, tried to find the intermuscular septum. So what do we do instead? We pierce the fascia and now I lift the arm. So now I know 100% sure that I'm anterior to the um, humerus. I'm not posterior, so the nerve is out of the way. Aim towards the radial head. When you go in and when you then open your cannula, fluid should, should come out. Then enter the camera, into the joint. We're looking towards the uh, radial head, and that's the first view we see. This patient had some, uh, some synovitis, maybe a little bit of arthritis. Coronary process there. Make sure that you can see the, corner, the, the little gutter on the medial side next to the coronary, because that's where loose bodies tend to hide. Look up towards the radial fossa and the coronoid fossa. Uh, again, for loose bodies, but also for, uh, for any osteophytes that are there. We then create an anterolateral portal. We do this with a needle. Um, the needle is important because with the tip of the needle, you, go to, you aim towards where you want to work. What we do is we aim the needle perpendicular to myself, perpendicular to the floor, parallel to the floor. Sorry, parallel to myself, parallel to the floor. And you see how I'm aiming towards the coronary process in this patient because I need to be able to reach the coronary process with my, in, with my instruments. And if the needle doesn't reach it, um, the instruments won't reach it either. Incise the skin and then go in a cutting fashion, go towards the, um, the lateral capsule. It's very acceptable to use a blunt instrument, uh, especially in the beginning of your learning curve. I prefer to use a blade because then that means I can go in and out and see the, the, the direction is always the same. And if with a blunt instrument, sometimes the portal in the capsule is slightly different to the portal in your skin. Palpate again, you don't need to draw again, but definitely palpate again. Make sure that you know where the, where the ulnar nerve is because sometimes because of the swelling, you might have uh, uh, displaced it a little bit and the ulnar nerve might be more lateral than you thought. We then get, go to the um, lateral tip of the olecranon and go with our blade, we go into the olecranon fossa. Um, make sure that you put your, cor uh, your, your trocar onto the bone and then push, do not pull. That's important. So push your trocar, uh, or your cannula, sorry, onto your trocar because if you do, then the cannula will be on the bone. And uh, if you pull the, on the trocar, the cannula will be off the bone and some soft tissue will always creep in between. That's the humerus, medial gutter, tip of the olecranon, again, some, ar some arthritis there. That's the olecranon fossa, which looks relatively normal, not a lot of uh, osteophytes. Um, I didn't talk about preoperative imaging yet because it's not, part, not really part of this, uh, of this uh, presentation, but preoperative imaging is obviously important with 3D CT scans where we look at where the osteophytes are so we know where to work. This is the standard central posterior portal, goes through the triceps, and similar to when you're doing um, a humeral nailing, 
make sure that you make the hole in the triceps big enough because when you go in and out with your instruments, you don't want to destroy the triceps every time you go in and out. So that's the working portal on the back. Uh, then once you've done that, once you've finished in the posterior side, you just slide your um, uh, cannula into the radiohumeral gutter and do it like this. You, there's no need to push or, or, or force it. Um, with the lateral portal that we make, the post-lateral portal that we make, we tend to, um, to just be able to slide it in. We then create a soft spot portal. Again, we use a needle, um, especially in the beginning when you start doing this, just use the same uh, hole as what you used before when you were insufflating the joint because it helps you to visualize where the needle ends up and it helps you to correct as well if you're not in the perfect spot. Do not make the, the incision in the, perf in the not perfect spot, but uh, just adjust your needle until you're happy that you can work without touching the cartilage on the radial head. What you see there is a loose body and on the right side, you saw a little bit of synovitis or synovial fault. It's almost always there, so it's not pathological. It's not the plica that we um, sometimes talk about. Well, let's go over some uh, some more safety tips and, and maybe look into uh, some of the things that I just went over very quickly, look at them in a little bit more detail. So with regards to safety, it starts with positioning of the patient and uh, we use lateral decubitus. Um, we use a little roll for the arm to, let, to rest on and the arms resting on the tourniquet. So we always use a tourniquet. Um, it's not necessary to do so. Some surgeons don't, but I prefer to use a tourniquet so I can decrease the water pressure and um, the swelling will be decreased post-op as well. Tourniquet is resting on my roll. The elbow is stable, but still very flexible. I'm able to move it. Um, I do not like the, the, the special um, arthroscopic um, supports because they have some Velcro over it. And then sometimes when you want to test flexion, you need to lift up the humerus. So I prefer to do it this way. As you can see, the elbow is not in 90 degrees. Mine is a little bit more um, extended and very, very relaxed. And then finally, the most important point, depend, irrespective of how you position this patient, the most important point is that the antecubital space is free. There's nothing pushing against my very important neurovascular structures. They're not pushing into my, um, into my uh, joint space. Palpate the ulnar nerve. We can't stress that enough. Palpate it, it's like a little guitar string when you palpate it perpendicular like we do, and then draw on the skin. This is my normal drawing. So again, um, uh, on the nerve and um, just the lateral side of the olecranon. Especially in the beginning, you can't draw enough in the patient. The patients don't mind if you draw on them. Uh, they do mind if you would uh, uh, accidentally cut a nerve because you don't know whether you're on the medial side or on the lateral side. So radial head. Uh, radial collateral uh, ligament, lateral ulnar collateral ligament in different uh, uh, direction. And this is a very comprehensive draw drawing on the, on the outside of the skin. So palpate the nerve, draw the nerve, draw whatever uh, landmarks you need. Some, some people even put an L for lateral and M for medial. So whatever you need, uh, make sure that you never, never uh, by accident think that you're lateral while you're working medial. Then distend uh, the joint. Uh, do this with fluid or air, uh, depending on what you what you want. Uh, this is a concept uh, concept from uh, David Stanley, or dr the original drawing from David Stanley. We adapted a little bit for the book. Um, but when you're not distending, like in this case, the nerves are right behind the capsule and are very close to your instrument in this case. So anteromedial portal, we see the, um, um, the scope going in. Lateral, anterolateral portal, you see the, the, the uh, shaver going in. Um, once you distend, you get a much better view and the neurovascular structures are out of the way. It's important to note that the neurovascular structures are not out of the way of the capsule. So as soon as you start uh, dissecting or um, removing the capsule, the nerves are right there. So distension does not help when you do a capsulectomy. Then you st still have to be very, very careful not to injure the nerves while you're doing this. So distend the joint um, with whatever you need. If there is a subplexing on the nerve, that's a, a relative contraindication. So it's not a real contraindication. However, you need to make sure that you know where the nerve is. So in this case, the nerve is subplexing. It's anterior to the uh, medial level condyle. So what we do is we reduce the nerve while I'm making my incision and I keep it reduced while I'm entering the joint. So it's, it's out of the way of my trocar. If you don't, you might you know, injure the nerve 
uh, more uh, likely by neuropraxia, but you might definitely injure this nerve if you don't know what your uh, uh, that the nerve was subluxing and that you didn't um, um, reduce it. Then the lateral portal, I already talked a little bit about that. The lateral portal, you see that yellow structure on the left, that's the radial nerve. That's definitely something that you do not want to injure. Um, that's very um, um, problematic for the patient if you do. So again, a lateral portal you create with the needle outside in, then use, uh, in my case, the blade or use a blunt instrument if you feel more comfortable. Um, use the direction like I told you, make sure that it's parallel to yourself and parallel to the, um, to the floor. And that makes, uh, makes it much easier to go in and out of the joint. Now let's go over some clear indications. And although osteoarthritis might be a difficult one, this is actually in my uh, practice is the most common one. So this is the most common indication for me to do elbow arthroscopy. You see lack of cartilage. You see there a big osteophyte at the top of the humerus. Um, uh, in elbow flexion, you get impingement of the um, uh, coronoid process against the cost of osteophytes in the coronoid fossa. And this is pain, not only painful, but also blocks the motion. CT scan, I already talked to you about that. We, we, uh, I like 3D CTs, but I, I really like looking at the 2D images of the CT as well. Well, if there's a big osteophyte and use a small five millimeter osteotome, it looks huge in the elbow, but it's only five millimeters and use this to knock off the osteophyte. That's a safe way of doing it. And it's actually the fastest way of doing it. And then if you look at the result, this is what you should get. So just knock it off with your uh, osteotome. If you need to, you can always change a little bit with your burr, but the osteotome makes it very easy and safe. In the fossa, we use a burr. This is similar to an arthroscopic decompression in the shoulder. Use a burr and make sure that you get a good result. This is the back of the elbow, very similar. That's the electron on there. Uh, a small, uh, loose uh, inside your osteophyte that pushes against the um, osteophytes in the electron on fossa. Some people call them Mickey Mouse ears. Uh, you can again get a small osteotome and just simply tap them off. and then uh, clean, it, clean it a little bit further with your burr so you get a nice anatomical reconstruction. We don't, I don't tend to use uh, outer bridge Kashiwagi procedure. Uh, I just um, try to recreate the, arthros uh, the anatomy. Then loose bodies, everyone always says this is the best way to uh, start arthroscopy. Uh, they can be very annoying, they're slippery, they're often very round and they're annoying to remove, but still, you know, it's, it's low risk arthroscopy, I guess. Chondromatosis, um, don't really, not really visible on CT, not all of them. Uh, sometimes you're surprised. And tennis elbow, um, we do arthroscopy with tennis elbow, although I prefer to use a, a mini open incision, but you can do this arthroscopically very safely. And uh, in some uh, um, publications, return to work is much faster. So I cut it with a knife, I, just like I would do uh, um, open. So we do a percutaneous release and then just clean it up with your, um, with your shaver. This is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Obviously, prognosis is not very good, uh, but it is a good procedure for pain relief. Uh, there's a loss of cartilage, with, which we tell the patients we can't do anything about, but we can um, take care of the synovitis and we can remove the riddle head quite easily uh, arthroscopically. I leave a little bit of radial head to the left. So uh, I remove about five millimeters there. So the radial head is not touching the capitellum anymore, but it's still uh, stabilized at least in a, uh, uh, medial lateral fashion. OCD lesion, this is from the front, this is from the back. You saw the loose body, you removed the loose body, uh, and then we tend to go into the radiofumal gutter just to clean out the lesion, um, debride it, and stabilize the, the articulating surface. You can use an ice pick if you want. This was a little bit older patient. In younger patients, I do not use an ice pick, I just use my, uh, my shaver. Uh, luckily, uh, we missed that little um, loose body, but it came out when we shaved it. And then trauma, Craig already talked about this. This is a dislocated elbow. Unfortunately, lots of uh, cartilage damage there at the back of the uh, um, capitellum and the back of the uh, um, trochlea. And this is a um, arthroscopic fixation, which is actually relatively easy. I love this fractures. Um, this is a coronoid fracture. Uh, I really, really enjoy this because like I said, I don't like opening up the medial side if I don't need to. And uh, arthroscopically, if it's a big piece, 
you can actually put a screw in uh, quite nicely and you can actually see this um, under direct visualization you can have your screw and your fixation and when you go to the back you can uh, you can see what you did with your reduction tumors that's obviously very rare this is a patient with pvns uh, sign of a, a synovial tumor this is a patient with osteo osteoma with uh, night pain and the Osteoma was uh, situated intraarticularly, and that's obviously quite easy to remove arthroscopically. And interestingly, the pain was gone immediately the day after. Instability, Craig already talked about that. Of, uh, of course, arthroscopic signs of instability, this is the anterior view. Uh, one of the things that we saw was sagging of the annular ligament. Um, there's a little band between, that actually Greg taught me, uh, taught, uh, uh, taught me, little band between the radius and the ulna that tightens the angular ligament with pronation like you saw. Opening on the medial side, as a reverse drive-through sign, what does that mean? You can get your, uh, your um, uh, cannula from lateral to medial quite easily, uh, sorry, from medial to lateral in reverse, and then from medial to lateral, lateral to medial in the um, actual drive-through sign. Actual traction in, uh, has been, we found that it was the most sensitive one. So you just pull on the radial head. If it opens, it's unstable. See how we pull? Uh, it's very difficult to do the pivot shift test arthroscopically because it sort of pushes your camera out of the way. So get a good view of a pivot shift test is difficult um, arthroscopically. We do an imbrication for this. Um, I'm not going into detail because it was supposed to be a talk on the basics, but it's a relatively simple technique that we um, have used for um, almost eight or nine years now. Um, so tips to start with elbow arthroscopy for those of you who want to start, remember, and we cannot, I cannot stress this enough, elbow arthroscopy is potentially dangerous. Uh, even after 10 years in practice and after a fellowship with Greg, I still feel a lot of respect for the nerves. Um, in every case, um, there is a learning curve. Start with easier, easier things. Maybe start with a diagnostic scope and then open it up. Study the elbow anatomy. Uh, if you can, go into a lab and study it. If you can, go to a course and get some hands-on uh, experience on, uh, uh, on cadaveric specimens that you can open up afterwards. Start with simple procedure, like I said. Um, take your time. Uh, take your time with positioning and setup. At the moment, my setup and positioning is very fast, but it, in, when I just started, it took almost 45 minutes to an hour to get the position, the position just right, because you do not want to change it after you've uh, started your procedure. And then very important, um, and uh, we used to do that all the time, tell your patients you may convert to open. Even if you don't need to, tell them, listen, I'm going to start arthroscopically, I'm going to look around, but this is a dangerous procedure for your radial nerve, for your ulnar nerve, for your median nerve even. Uh, I might, during your procedure, I might convert to an open procedure and give you a little cut so I can protect the nerves. And patients don't care. They, they, they tell you, okay, sure, doctor, do whatever you need, but please don't cut my nerve. And, and they don't mind to have a small incision uh, compared to a, um, to a nerve injury. It's very rare that you need to. So in most cases, you probably don't need to open it up. But if you, did, if you didn't tell them and you feel the pressure to continue, even if you, in your heart you know it's not safe, that's probably one of the worst things you can do. Thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I think uh, you, you, have, you have discussed and covered most of the topics, indications for elbow arthroscopy. Just one uh, question, just uh, based on this. Um, and we are discussing how, how difficult or how easy is it for arthritic elbow, because you said that your common indication is arthritic elbows. And also in a stiff elbow, yes. some comments. That's a good question. So arthritic elbow with uh, bony stiffness, and I mean impingement or because of osteophytes, that's standard. So the capsule is usually still quite soft. You can, uh, you can um, 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 insufflate your fluid or your air, and it will open up. Um, in stiff elbows, it's a little bit more difficult. So in stiff elbows, especially post-traumatic ones, maybe some that have had some surgery before, um, the capsule is very non-compliant. And, and when you inject, you inject under a lot of pressure sometimes, and sometimes you can't even get a lot of fluid in. So what you do then is you try to get your scope into the joint. Don't start shaving straight away. Uh, make a lateral portal a little bit higher, so a little bit more proximal on the, on the humerus. So it's safe and you know you're away from the... Um, away from the uh, actual nerve. But this is a little bit higher grade arthroscopy. Huh? Stay away from the nerve. 
then you can use a blunt instrument to dissect the capsule from the proximal part of your of your joint and you can enter the joint like that that um, portal can be used to work from so you can start shaving direct your shaver towards the bone and just take away the peel away the capsule from the bone and go towards the distal side if you if you stay on the bone you're safe but make sure that you're on the bone because this can be deceptive as well you can think that you're on the bone but you might not be so do not use any suction uh, especially don't when you don't know where you, where exactly you are don't use any suction while the shaver is active uh, stay on the bone and just dissect slowly slowly um, uh, distally you can use um, periosteal elevators if you want and that portal uh, might not be the only portal that you want to make in a lateral side, but that portal can be used to use re to insert retractors into the joint. So as soon as you see your instrument, you put a retractor in, and then you can make a more distal um, uh, anterolateral portal, which is then safe because you know exactly where you are, and you're not sliding away from, or you're not, you know, slipping at the anterior part of, of your uh, anterolateral capsule because that's where the danger is. Um, it's very important to be methodical when you're doing this. So when when I started with the way Greg taught me, it's just basically you do the same all the time. You do the same steps, steps, steps. And uh, we know Sean Driscoll, who's, who's one of the best teachers uh, that we know, he talks about entering the room and then creating a view. So you enter the room, you know that you're in the, in the joint, and then you start creating the view. And once you have the view, then you start working. And um, that's basically what we do with every arthroscopy, but it becomes more challenging with stiff elbows. With simple degenerative changes, with a, with a normal capsule or a relatively normal capsule, I insufflate the joint. You, you saw how big how big of, of a space that we get. Um, you go in, you, make your, you create your anterior portal where you need to, and then you start working. So that's relatively easy compared to stiff elbows. Stiff elbows are a challenge. Okay. Dr. Van Rijt, uh, so a very clear presentation. Uh, Dr. Clement here. Uh, regarding the tennis elbow arthroscopy, you told that you prefer an open approach. What are your points uh, that uh, you, because of why you favor an open approach? Do you release ECRB? Uh, any tips if you for arthroscopic release of tennis elbow? So these are the yes. points I, I, I want you to clarify. Thank you. I have a very non-scientific reason uh, to um, to do this to do this open. Um, we uh, we we do a fair amount of, of tennis elbow surgery. It's a big uh, arthroscopy is a relatively big strain on our uh, infrastructure and our hospital. We have uh, so many indications for arthroscopy that we do we do three or four arthroscopies uh, per uh, per setting. And um, if we would add the elbow arthroscopy, it would be a strain. Initially. I, um, I started doing elbow arthroscopy, uh, sorry, elbow, uh, tennis elbow arthroscopy as well, uh, because I thought it would be better and, and uh, I thought patients would return to work uh, quicker with less pain. I, I didn't see a lot of difference. So with my mini open technique that we use, uh, I do reattach the um, ECRB. With the mini open technique that we use, we didn't see a lot of differences post-op with regards to pain or return to work or um, or um, you know the end result after one year, so uh, we, we converted back to um, the mini open simply because of that. Uh, when do we do elbow arthroscopy for tennis elbow? Is when I feel that there's an intraarticular problem as well. So uh, when when there's a lot of synovitis, when there may be a thickened plica, uh, when uh, there is a loose body or degenerative changes, because sometimes you know not all elbow pain, lateral elbow pain is tennis elbow. But uh, you can have tennis elbow and degenerative change at the same time. Well, those are indications for me to do uh, to do uh, arthroscopic tennis elbow surgery. Uh, with regards to the second part of your question, yes, what we do now is we uh, we do a percutaneous release of the uh, ECRB CRL insertion. So I go in with my blade, like almost like you saw on the, under the view uh, arthroscopic view, go in with my blade just anterior to the LCL complex, which I palpate. I go down towards the um, radial head, just the tip of my blade will probably touch the radial head and I know where I am. Um, then I turn my blade around, but stay in my cut, go up towards the humerus. And as soon as my, my, um, my blade touches the humerus, then I basically make a turn on the humerus. I stay on the humerus and then go one or two centimeters uh, more proximal to um, um, one centimeter more proximal to uh, release the entire insertion site. Um, what we do then in the open procedure is I open it up uh, with an incision of about a centimeter. Um, 
remove all the you know bad uh, tissue in the tendon and uh, debride till I see almost a perfect tendon, not perfect tendon, but almost perfect tendon. We use a small bone anchor and then I really, and then I suture it back. In arthroscopy, it's slightly different because we go in with our blade percutaneous the same way, but we leave this, the fascia and all the overlying tissue intact. So we go in and then I debride until I see um, a good tendon and then we stop, I don't reinsert. It's a slightly smaller um, approach to the tendon, a little bit less damage to the tendon and uh, that's why we don't reinsert in arthroscopy. Thank you, Dr. Roger. I think from all of us from Bangalore, we thank you immensely for your contribution for this teaching. You're wonderful, very welcome. wonderful presentation. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. I think that with this, we will conclude on this and then we'll go to Dr. David uh, to discuss on stiff elbow. Over to you, Dr. David. Okay. So, um, it's great that uh, Roger talked about the role of arthroscopy in uh, the stiff elbow because um, in, in my experience, I, I find that uh, my patients uh, frequently require open surgeries. Um, this will be the scope of what we'll be covering uh, through this presentation. Um, I think it's important um, for those of us who are beginning to approach this to understand that uh, elbow stiffness can be attributed to either articular causes or extra-articular causes. While osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis, inflammatory arthritis are um, reasons why we may see an elbow that's stiff. The most common reason in our practice, at least as a, you know, elbow specialist, is from sequel of trauma, whether it results in an altered articular geometry, arterial fibrosis, or the sequel of treatment, which may be hardware-related or technique-related. Extra articular causes, well, um, you normally want to think, you normally want to, you know, think of things like tightening and thickening of the capsule and heterotopic ossification, which can be seen in certain circumstances. The elbow tends to be very prone to that. Um, there's a small group of patients who may have neurogenic and neuromuscular spasticity. So this is what would be a typical, uh, typical stiff elbow in degenerative uh, arthritis. Um, and while the plain film x-rays look normal, once you get a CD scan, uh, you're apt to see loose bodies filling up the coronoid, olecranon fossa, osteophytic lifting at the uh, olecranon process. Uh, quite often, these patients don't uh, come to you with complaints of stiffness. They may not realize it themselves. Um, and more surprising that not many of them sometimes turn up with symptoms of ulnar neuropathy. Um, patients with inflammatory arthritis um, in the early stages, uh, when there's synovial proliferation, they have subtle um, stiffness in the elbow, which they do recognize and sometimes not so much pain. And this is one of the things that you need to pay attention for um, because you need to compare both elbows. And um, just look at the anatomical uh, hollows um, on the medial side of the elbow and at the posterior lateral soft spot. These are the areas where you can pick up a thickening of the capsule or bulk around the capsule region. Um, just touching quickly on this, neuromuscular causes, uh, aside from stroke, uh, patients with spastic cerebral palsy can have stiffness while many of times um, this stiffness may uh, appear to resolve with um, patients under anesthesia or when you're asleep. Uh, long-standing neuromuscular spasticity will also lead to uh, fixed contractures of the elbow. Um, uh, sometimes it's what we do uh, with the treatment. In this case, a patient who had a radial head fracture dislocation of the elbow and the index surgery uh, or the index surgeon just did a radial hip replacement, failing to repair the lateral arm and collateral uh, ligament. So it's not unexpected that it four months down, what you see is various instability, some translation of the elbow wearing out the coronary. So this is part of the sequel of treatment. And this results not only in a stiff elbow, but a painful elbow, as you can see over here. The patient has really limited range of motion. Um, sometimes you get bad trauma. This patient had a, 
uh, combinated uh, C3 type distal humerus fracture by columnar plates. This is hardware protruding and impinging to the joint. The CT scan on the lower left corner shows you how the screws are not in where they're supposed to be and they're accompanied by bone. And this video over here shows that projection of bone with the screw just underneath over there. Uh, heterotopic ossification, uh, the, like I said, the elbow is very prone to heterotopic ossification. And here, um, there's pretty profound loss of flexion extension and then effect of the forearm rotation in this patient. Um, why does the elbow tend to get stiff? Well, the elbow joint is highly congruous, so it doesn't really have very much play and thus becomes very prone to factors like thickening of the capsule. Again, while this happens in any joint, the elbow seems to have that propensity to, towards thickening of the capsule. Couple that with the um, increased bone formation just around the joint, uh, this makes the elbow very prone to uh, post-traumatic stiffness. How much motion is really needed in the elbow? Well, um, Moray suggested a flexion extension arc of 100 degrees, uh, preferably between the 30 to 130 degree mark uh, for function and about 50 degrees of pronation and supination. Um, with compensatory motion, uh, you know, whether it's adaptive moving the trunk, the shoulder uh, to, to bend down, uh, patients can even work with a smaller degree of function of 75 to 120 degrees. Um, just be aware that um, for the patients with a stiff elbow, the loss of extension is usually better tolerated than the loss of flexion where you actually need self-care. And these are the ones that you actually want to address the problems. Um, so what are my indications? Well, I, I typically look towards restoring a functional elbow motion. So patients who have flexion contracture of more than 40 degrees or who can flex less than 110 degrees. I do give special consideration for vocational requirements or a vocational or professional requirements. Some examples of that would be, you know, if you were a gymnast, um, you need full elbow extension, you know, so on and so forth. Of course, there are contraindications and obviously the non-compliant patient, whether it's a patient with a head injury, altered GCS, psychiatric issues, substance abuse. These are all reasons why not to uh, release a stiff elbow. Now, one needs to be cautious about the incongruous elbow, the elbow which really has got uh, uh, the onset of arthritis. And this is typified by pain to the mid of the motion. Another caution is the stiff and unstable elbow because um, most of the times you can recognize this by a stiff uh, elbow joint and an incongruous uh, arnold humeral joint on joint that is out of position. So just be aware that this is one of those uh, stiff elbow contraindications to a uh, contracture release because what, what you see in there is that the trochlea has been grinding on a coronoid for a long time. There's uh, virtually no coronoid over there. There are deep uh, osteochondral uh, ulcers uh, in the trochlea. So this is not really a suitable candidate for um, a contracture release of the elbow. What are the radiological uh, requirements? Well, uh, plain film x-rays and multiple views will usually give you a clue as to what is the problem, but it's insufficient um, to plan for surgery. And I always get a CT scan. Um, I don't usually see much value in a MRI unless I think that this is a soft tissue problem. Um, and this allows you to determine exactly where to direct your surgical efforts towards, as well as it may dictate your approach. Certainly, um, some, sometimes it will reveal information for you. This is a patient with stiff elbow. And um, if you were to just look, you know, there is a reduced joint space and destruction of the articular uh, architecture of the trochlea, so it's not an elbow that's uh, suitable for contracture release. Before taking any patient to a contracture release, ensure that patients have sufficient uh, physiotherapy um, and obviously no uh, outstanding or uh, uh, obstructing heterotopic ossification and a congruous joint. In those cases, the patients uh, 
can see some benefit from physiotherapy and the use of static progressive splints, like what we see over here, as well as anti-inflammatories may give patients as much as 30 degrees of motion from the time that they first present to you. Um, so I, I only perform open contracture releases. Uh, I reserve uh, arthroscopy for sinovectomies and the removal of foreign bodies, uh, loose bodies. And the approaches may be medial or lateral. Those are what I typically employ, although some surgeons do use a posterior and a sometimes an anterior approach. Um, this is guided by surgeon preference and of course uh, the pathology, but certain considerations will uh, guide uh, the choice of approach for me. Um, the presence of ulnar neuropathy or when flexion is limited almost always uh, mandates a medial approach and the location of the heterotopic ossification will also uh, guide where I want to put my incision. The placement of hardware and if revision is indicated. So these are some of the general principles uh, or basically what we need to think about when you're looking at a stiff post-traumatic elbow. So what you want to do is restore flexion, you want to clear out the coronoid corsa, you want to excise part of the coronoid, you want to release or do a posterior capsulectomy and a triceps tenolysis. In order to get extension, however, what you want to do is do an anterior capsulectomy excise part of the olecranon and clear the olecranon fossa. So this is uh, the typical medial approach that I use. So this is uh, described by Hoshkis called the medial of the top. Here the intermuscular septum has been, is being excised after the ulnar nerve has been decompressed. And what I work with is using a cop elevator. I elevate the brachialis off uh, the distal end of the humerus you, together with a combination of uh, diatomy. And you come down to the flexor perineter, you can see that's the origin. I make a mark about two centimeters and then using the cautery, I go through this flexor perineter origin and I stop just short of when I get down to the capsule. Then I next develop the plane distally between the humeral head of the FCU and the rest of the flexor perineter. And I go back to my bovi or the quadri and continue to elevate um, this muscle mass off the anterior capsule. Generally, one, as I work towards um, the lateral aspect and reach the brachialis, I just want to see the undersurface of the brachialis. And as I get even further lateral, um, I usually go more cautious and slow because we are coming to the territory of the radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve. Um, the lateral approach, well, I don't have a video over here, but what is typically done is through this incision, you elevate the mobile watts in the anterior half of the common extensors. Sometimes I take a Kaplan interview, uh, interval. Um, through this lateral approach, we can also elevate the posterior lateral triceps. Um, and just bear in mind that in your uh, contracture releases, you want to preserve the lateral on the collateral ligaments, so you want to stay anterior. Uh, on the capitellum. Uh, this lateral approach also gives you access to the radial head if the radial head is a cause of uh, loss of pronation and supination. Uh, however, proximal extension necessitates identification of the radial nerve, so there's a limit to how far you can go, usually around about seven centimeters up. I'm just going to go to some case illustrations. Um, patient who had a posterior olecranon fracture dislocation or what appears to be that. And this is patient's, uh, you know, fixation uh, films at seven months uh, following surgery. Um, the patient has um, kind of maxed out on therapy. Um, the elbow's going to around about 90 degrees and he's just got about 20 degrees of supination over here. It's not quite happy with the results. Um, CD scans shows as all usually uh, what is the cause of the motion loss. So here we see uh, posterior to the radius uh, coming from the olecranon, that's a posterior bone block. Um, we can see that there may be some a little bit of implants to the joint. Obviously, the, the radial head uh, has not quite united, um, but the rest of the honorohumeral joint looks um, pretty well preserved. And so this would be a candidate uh, for a contracture release and since the fracture has healed, um, remove all the implants. So the previous excess was posterior, so you, you reutilize that. You identify the ulnar nerve, you 
form a neurolysis before you go on and do your contracture release. And this is um, uh, the, the, the bone block coming from the uh, proximal ulna towards the radius over there. This is the one, just refresh our memory. And, and um, what, you, what you see over there is that supination is just caused by that uh, overhanging bone and that just needs to be removed um, in surgery. Post-operatively, I think it's essential. And for all my patients with you know, moderate contractures uh, or severe contractures, they stay in patient, they have an indwelling catheter that stays there for two to three days. Uh, they get on a CPM. And um, the, the, the best thing about this indwelling catheters is that uh, usually by the second day, they have a sensory block, but they don't have a motor block and they can do these things actively. I leave the drains in there for two days. That's the usual maximum, and I just pull them out. Um, this is the uh, post removal, and this is somewhere around about two and a half years. Um, and patients generally are able to maintain the gains um, that they have achieved at six months post uh, contracture release um, for the long term. Um, this is a slightly different situation. This patient had a PRUJ synostosis from uh, both bone form fractures and a chronically dislocated radial head. Um, he has some problem with just supination. That's just about zero to 20 degrees you see over there. He's got the flexion extension of the elbow. And uh, CD scans, again, I, I want to emphasize our uh, are uh, invaluable and uh, indispensable in any stiff uh, elbow or forearm pathology. And here we can see that uh, thick uh, bony synostosis going across uh, from the proximal uh, half of the ulna uh, towards the radius, and obviously the radial head is out of position. Um, so uh, this is what I would normally do. Um, I like to get there, remove the bone, um, that's causing the block, the synostosis. Um, um, and in this case, um, the bone surfaces, I, I don't wrap in any kind of fascia lata or biomembranes. I just put some bone wax. And for the more proximal synostosis, usually this is amenable to anconius interposition, which you can see just around there after we have removed the radial head. That's quite a bit of bone over there. Um, it's always important to ensure that you have a uh, full passive uh, motion following a contracture release, and this should be something that's easy. Uh, you shouldn't need to apply a lot of force to do to do that. Um, this is a patient at the, um, you know three years follow up, so he's he hasn't lost any of his elbow flexion extension. He's gained full supination, uh, maybe lost lost a touch of uh, pronation. Um, in addition to having taken out the the ulnar plate, um, so put in a recon uh, radial head because I thought this was a young guy and uh, it'd be helpful for him. We'll see. Um, finally, in this last case illustration, this is a capitalis shear fracture dislocation. Uh, here we can see the extent of the injury, the medial trochlea. Here's the free uh, lateral trochlea and capitalis fracture and a fractured radial head. Um, this is just one of many scalable injuries in a patient who also suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it's not unsurprising that in spite of this uh, stable and concentric anatomic reduction, um, the patient developed massive heterotopic ossification. Here is anterolateral, posterior medial. You can't get a proper AP, so this is why we think there's all big projections. And anterior largely and a little bit posterior. And this is at post-op day, about 80 days. So that's about two and a half months. This patient has extensive heterotopic ossification. Uh, CT scan is in order once again. It helps you plan. Um, and basically, you see the location is uh, largely anteromedial. Um, the capitella uh, shear fracture seems to be um, stable, uh, maybe united already. And um, implants don't seem to be impinging into the joint. Um, so after the uh, typical medial uh, over-the-top approach, um, we excise the capsule and then we excise the superior bone blocks first of all um, using a combination of osteotome and ronger. 
and subsequently uh, you want to work and clear out the coronoid fossa, um, I try to start with uh, osteocombs first and um, sometimes if I if I can't get uh, my osteotomes in, I follow the ronger. Uh, I'm not uh, afraid to just go through uh, and make it really thin out um, because I think that's much more preferred than um, and then excising too much of the coronoid. Then clear the anterolateral blocks and now you know flex the elbow and check. And this is the things that you want to do. You want to clear the anterior superior heterotopic ossification. You want to clear the coronoid fossa. And just round off the tip of the, the coronoid, usually around about centimeter at most. Here we are excising the anterior capsule, medial to lateral, and always stay deep to the brachialis. And just slow down a little when you're getting close to the, to the radial head and the radial neck. Um, and sometimes I, I just dissect this area very carefully before, um, before um, I elevate the capsule off. And just work on clearing any bone blocks at the uh, proximal radio on the joint over there. So this is the patient post-op and um, this is this is what she had pre-op. So she had pretty profound uh, loss of supination, very limited elbow flexion and um, um, this is uh, around about three months post-surgery. Um, you can see that um, she has slight reduction of the anal humeral joint space, probably some chondrolysis uh, from the capital shear fracture, um, uh, but she's got uh, the motion that uh, she gained immediately pre-op, post-operatively and maintained up to three months. So I guess I'll, I'll end off here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, for the excellent uh, ex exposition on the <clears throat> topic of stiff elbow, the commonest to what we uh, see in day-to-day -day practice. So before we uh, ask, go, ask you some questions, please stay back. It's a very interesting topic. I'm sure you'll have some questions. Can we go on to uh, Greg Bain for his talk on salivate procedures in the elbow? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. So salvage uh, is an interesting topic. I think we've covered uh, most of the topics tonight, but uh, this is going to go on and talk about some other aspects. So this is a patient that presented to me with uh, persistent instability uh, that had it for more than six months, despite two surgical reconstructions. And we can see the coronoid process. We can also see that there is this bony avulsion of the posterior medial aspect of the MCL. So I thought this patient had posterior medial rotatory instability. So how do we stabilize that coronoid process? So we've already heard about the importance of possibly taking the uh, electronon. Uh, you can take out part of the radial head or the area that we've had most experience with is taking one of the ribs. So with the rib, uh, uh, there are other alternatives, including the iliac crest. <clears throat> So when you take the rib, you take the aspect which includes the bony aspect and the articular cartilage, which, which is, sorry, not articular cartilage, hyaline cartilage. So the rib is actually made of hyaline cartilage, which is similar material to the articular cartilage that we know. So we can see that we've created a trough here and the rib, ha rib has been impaled into the hole. And what we've put is a KY down there in preparation for applying a plate. So this, uh, I think, is actually the uh, plate that uh, is designed for the coronoid process, but you can just use an ordinary plate like off the AO handset to provide stability down the front. So you can see that it's sitting in a nice position and providing stability for the coronoid process. In this, uh, another case here, we can see that what we've done is we've stabilized uh, with the coronoid process and we've put the plate in position and we've required also to put a hamstring tendon graft so as we take the elbow through a range of motion, we can see here that the medial collateral ligament is providing the intrinsic stability of the elbow along with the coronoid process. So those two components together are required in some cases to be able to provide stability. David uh, did discuss uh, with regard to some of the concepts of stiffness, and I just want to add to that. So uh, Bernie Mori highlighted the importance of looking at stiffness as it being intra-articular or extra-articular. 
But there's an important subgroup here, which is the capsular group. And the capsular group's important because uh, often patients who've just been immobilized or they've maybe had a soft tissue injury, the primary problem can be capsular contracture. And these can just be managed with the resection of the capsule, which can be performed as an arthroscopic procedure. David did highlight the importance of this uh, neurological group, and particularly in the elbow, those involving the ulnar nerve um, are an important subgroup of that. So there can be, of course, patients with um, cerebral palsy and things, but also just localised pain on the medial side of the elbow. So this is a patient who presented to me that had burns, uh, including uh, those around the elbow. But in fact, the main problem was that the ulnar nerve was pinched in this heterotopic ossification and the patient presented with pain on the medial side of the elbow. And that this can be quite disabling for the patient and the patient will then avoid full extension or full flexion because of the pinching. So the treatment in our practice would be uh, some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications for a period of two weeks. And we can use deep X-ray therapy as well, like used in cancer treatment, but it's a much smaller dose. And ideally the, the, the treatment can actually be performed the day before the surgery. So the patient can hop up onto the couch in the radiotherapy uh, suite, have the radiotherapy, and then the next day have the surgery. They don't have to turn up there after the surgery with a sore elbow or with slings and uh, drips in. We tend to try and use a triceps on approach so that we're not disrupting the triceps and we can go to the medial or the lateral sides depending upon what we need, but it's important to try and maintain the stability of the joint. So we need to respect the nerves, we need to respect the joint stability, and if you're doing a manipulation in these cases, you need to be cautious with that. You don't want to have an uh, iatrogenic fracture. So in that case I just showed you there, we can see up the top here that small uh, osteo uh, heterotopic ossification around the ulnar nerve, and the thing that we like to use is the kerosene rongeurs. The kerosene rongeurs are used by the spinal surgeons. They have this little foot plate, and then as you pinch on them with the, the rongeur, it pinches down and you can take that bit of bone out. Around all the nerves, you, there's always a little bit of perineural fat. So you can always get this little foot plate into position and to remove the heterotopic ossification. So on your top left there demonstrates the kerosene rongeur and we can see how this can then be advanced into position and taking away that heterotopic ossification. Once this has been performed and we've got the medial epicondyle on view, it is possible to perform a gentle manipulation, but in this sort of case, you really wanna see the nerve and watch it, and there's, there's a fair chance you may need to do an anterior transposition of the old nerve, but if the nerve's sitting there fine and doesn't look as though it's gonna to be too tight, then you could do the manipulation. Or you might even do a bit more of a debridement of a medial epicondylectomy, which is a technique that some surgeons like to do when they're doing ulnar nerve surgery anyway. So this is another case, probably a little bit more complex. And I present it to you because it, there's some important lessons there. And I'm, I'm pleased that I thought about the lessons before I did the surgery and not afterwards. So this patient was 35, had significant burns. They didn't have an elbow injury. It was just part of their inflammatory response to the complex burn. And I want to highlight here this CT scan. The articular surfaces probably look a little bit narrowed, but they're actually not too bad. And when you resect all of that heterotopic ossification, this articulation will still work. We're often taught that it's important that there be flow of the joint to be able to pump the synovial fluid. But the articular cartilage will still survive with an ankylosis of the elbow, such as in this case, so the joint will still work once the heterotopic ossification has been removed. And what you've been looking at with this extensive ossification is that this is where the ulnar nerve goes. The ulnar nerve is completely encased in bone. And so it's important that this is identified prior to the surgery and that you've made plans to do that. So we do the preoperative deep X-ray therapy and the anti-inflammatories. We use transdynamic acid to try and minimize the bleeding and uh, good hemostasis. And in this case, I've been making an incision down the medial side and the lateral side, really just so that I don't undermine uh, the skin. And we do column releases as, uh, as um, Bernie taught us about doing a column release on the lateral side or the medial side. We talked about the kerosens. 
But once you removed all the bone, you need to be in a position that you can stabilize the joint if the joint becomes unstable. So if we have a look at this particular case here, we know the ulnar nerve goes down there and the yellow areas that I've marked are normal bone and everything between it's like there's been candle wax just dripping onto the joint. And so we have the heterotopic ossification. You can even see the little staple there from the, the, the plastic surgeons have put skin grafts there. But we can demarcate the normal bone to the heterotopic ossification. And so we can see that on the humerus and also the ulna. The bone is actually quite soft and, and the bone that we saw David remove it before, he was just able to put a rongeur on there and take it out. This bone is soft because it's not been loaded in the same way as the normal bone is. And Wolf's Law would say if it's not loaded that it doesn't become um, strong uh, corticalized bone. And then once we take out all this soft bone, we can then go back down to the joint and then we look and see what's happening with the ligaments. So we did that, the patients, uh, in fact, the, some of the deeper ligaments were there and the patient did not require a ligament reconstruction. This case here is a radio synostosis. It's a complication of a two incision distal biceps tendon repair. The other time that we've seen this type of synostosis is when the Boyd approach is used, which is where the anconeus is released on the ulnar border of the subcutaneous border of the ulna. So when, if we wanna get rid of this bone, the Boyd approach is actually the one that can cause this type of heterotopic ossification, but it's also the surgical approach to excise it. So the Boyd approach is the best approach to cause a synostosis and to excise one or to create a one bone forearm. So we can see here we've released all the soft tissues or muscle on the subcutaneous border of the ulna. We can see the heterotopic ossification here and a laminar spreader put there will just help remove some of this, uh, identify this zone so that we can remove it. An important subgroup of the, the heterotopic ossification is if the articulation of the joint is compromised. And we need to identify that prior to surgery. You don't wanna just remove all this bone and then find that the joint is unstable. In this case, we can take the bone out and the patient should do quite well. And we agree with David that the use of an anconeus interposition as described by Simon Bell is a good surgical option so that we can get a reasonable outcome in these patients. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, arthroplasty. So this is hemiarthroplasty. This is uh, involving just the humerus. And so we've done, had some experience in, in these comminuted um, supracondylar fractures in the older patients and also in non-unions. So it's, it's those patients who, have, um, who are older that we think that we should be considering this as an option. And uh, Roger spoke before about performing arthroplasty in these older patients. And we would totally agree that in the older patient to go to an arthroplasty is a better option than trying to put multiple screws in this very soft bone. Um, however, if, if you don't have the prosthesis available to you, that the bag of bones is the other options that, that is available to you. So when we do this hemiarthroplasty or total elbow in this group, we use a triceps retracting approach going medial and lateral we excise the distal humerus component and we get a size match prosthesis and uh, this is all cemented into position. Uh, this paper that I wrote with uh, Joy Deep Fadness and Adam Watts uh, covers I think most of the important points and you might find it of value to you. So this is where sutures are placed through the center of rotation and through the epicondyles to stabilize this whole construct. It's important to appreciate the most significant complication here is elbow instability. This is an elbow instability procedure. You need to be aware of that as, as really the primary aim of the surgery. So acknowledge Graham King here, a 10 year follow up for this patient. I think it's a pretty good outcome, but you can see there's still a bit of joint space narrowing in this particular patient. We can see the bone graft being placed here to provide extra stability for the prosthesis. But what about this case here? This patient has an olecranon fracture, rheumatoid arthritis, but it could also be for those patients who have osteoarthritis and other conditions, and elbow arthroplasty is, is, is indicated in these different groups. In this particular case, where there's this very thin bone, my preferred technique is to excise that bone and then put the, the triceps onto this particular, the proximal aspect of this ulna, and we've found that works better than trying to stabilize this electron fracture. 
We recently uh, performed a review of um, 10 years from the National Joint Register in Australia. I'd like to particularly acknowledge Dr. Vivine with regard to her excellent work in putting this paper together. And we can see that, that there's an, uh, an increase in the trauma cases which have been used in our registry and a decrease in rheumatoid arthritis as our rheumatologists have done an excellent job in decreasing those patients who require that sort of treatment. The revision rate is interesting to see. It's almost 20% uh, at nine or 10 years. So this is about double the rate of revision for a shoulder arthroplasty. The revisions are higher in um, osteoarthritis uh, and lower in trauma. So the trauma cases actually have a better prognosis than even rheumatoid arthritis in our joint registry. But the osteoarthritis are those that have a higher risk. And if we look at the complications, we have infection and loosening. These are the two important ones. And these are the things that we need to address. I'd also like to highlight there's some instability in those cases, which includes the proximal ulnar replacement and the radius replacement. These are a difficult case. So how do I do it? Lateral position, intravenous antibiotics, tourniquet, and I try really hard to make this a no-touch technique. There's different ways to do it. Uh, this is probably the most popular way is a lateral para olecranon approach. And this opens up, releases the ulnar nerve and dislocates the joint. And the technique that I use, I dress the proximal humerus with these tapes, uh, so, sorry, packs. This is um, a hydro, um, hydrogen peroxide pack that's put in there and uh, so that it's pumped into position and an infantile feeding tube so that it doesn't build up pressure. We pump this antibiotic cement into there and then we put our prosthesis into position with our, um, with our cement restrictor as well. So we try really hard to make sure that we've got all the cement, cement concepts correct as would a, a hip arthroplasty surgeon. We think this is important to try and minimize the chance of loosening. We use antibiotic cement as well. And uh, which prosthesis do we use? There's many different sorts of prostheses. Um, previously, we had a lot of experience with the Coonrad Mori. We tend to use um, this latitude at the moment, partly because we can link it together and we can lock it together. It's important to identify that, uh, so this extra piece is attached to provide stability so it can't dislocate. However, our registry demonstrates that there are problems with regard to this radial head, with regard to dislocations and dissociations. So in our practice, we do not use this radial head prosthesis anymore, but we do link this prosthesis in every single case. So what about this case as a patient that I'd performed uh, an arthroplasty on 15 years before, I was worried this was infected. I, I didn't know for sure. So we did, uh, we used an arthroscopic technique to, uh, to get biopsies of the articulation. We send them off to microbiology and histopathology so that we can identify whether this is a bacterial infection. To try and minimize the chance that we may have a false positive, we use histopathology as well to see if there's any white blood cells. What we really wanna do is at two weeks, we want to talk to our microbiologist so that we know whether this is infected or not and make the right decision as to whether we do a one or two stage procedure or whether we just give them antibiotics or whatever we need to do, but we want to know whether it's infected or not. So thank you very much for having me involved. Uh, it's been um, a, a quite a long session with all this, but I think we've covered an amazing amount of interesting stuff. So thank you very much for having me involved. <laughs> Thanks uh, so much, Greg, for sharing those uh, uh, difficult elbows. There's a question for you, uh, particularly in patients with uh, preoperative, you know, radiotherapy. Do you have problems with the uh, soft tissue healing? Uh, no, the um, the the dosage is 700 rads, so it's a relatively small dose. And at that dose, there's never been. Um, a confirmed case of malignant transformation after that. So I think it, it's a, compared to say what you might use in breast cancer or other medical conditions, it's a low dose, uh, but uh, we've found it to be, to be a good option for those patients who are at high risk. And so the fact is it's not that many cases where, that we're doing it, but I think that for those cases that are a high risk, it's worth considering. Thanks so much. Uh, question to David. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what what percentage of motion do you lose? You know, you achieve some 
uh, range of motion on table on the operating table yeah. so over a period of say 6 months 1 year what is the percentage of motion you tend to lose after your el- uh, elbow arthritis what percentage average um well i understand the you know, aggressive approach of uh, uh, protocol is ex- extremely good with your invariant catheter and then immediate mobilization but in spite yeah. of that you know with elbows yeah. okay yeah so i i, I think uh, a few things um what i what i want to emphasize is that um intraoperatively uh, you should be able to achieve the maximal flexion and extension and um i didn't recognize this when i was doing uh, elbow fl- uh, contracture releases early but um sometimes when you haven't done sufficient clearance of um your coronoid or your olecranon and your you know putting force to extend the elbow what you're doing is you're unhinging the joint now that that leads to a situation where post operatively the patient will never be able to get the kind of motion that um you achieve intraoperatively the other thing that um is um important is that um i watch patients very closely for the first uh 3 to 4 weeks um aside from the regular analgesia i give them low dose steroids and i but i do tend to note that there is a small subgroup of patients somewhere between 2 to 4 weeks who end up getting um what we call a gel elbow where it's usually a lot of core contraction of the triceps and the brachialis muscles and i if i catch a patient like that i don't hesitate to you know bring uh, the patient in put them on analgesia sometimes put them on a block and do a manipulation and then analgesia just to to get them moving again um but what percentage of patients uh, or how much is lost in following a contracture release well i in my um uh, observations um generally the thing that tends to get lost given that you've done you know a proper capsule like to me you done a proper bony clearance is extension and um this loss of extension seems to be uh more of a problem um in the elderly patients they tend to lose uh, the extension they gain um intraoperatively and generally it's around about 20 degrees um what i mentioned early on in my in my presentation was that um while some studies have shown that if patients maintain uh, the range of motion gains beyond a year it's sustained for 7 to 8 years thereafter i believe in the medium medium term studies um what i've noticed is between 6 months to 1 year for my patients there's real no, no real difference so usually after i've seen them at 6 months i bring them back at years no difference and beyond which i actually stop following them up long term and once i get down to 6 months i kind of cut them loose thank you what what's your experience in uh, pediatric elbows do they, do they um, fare better than the adults or is it something different number one uh, yeah. okay well um so so the the kind of pediatric elbow uh that i i deal with are patients with cerebral palsy i i don't see um that same kind of post traumatic uh, stiffness mainly because um my my practice is as such um so it's i i guess i don't have that experience to talk about post traumatic stiffness in a pediatric elbows um neuromuscular spasticity i i think it's not just a uh, a a question of doing capsular releases quite often uh, we're weakening muscles so or doing neurectomies to to take away that spastic effects yeah thank you so much uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, you know wonderful presentation by all of you uh, i thoroughly enjoyed this uh, webinar especially by dr craig and uh, uh, david and van reed one question uh, some of the discussion just to conclude uh, dr bain about the ulnar synostosis you were mentioning what about the recurrence rates in the surgeries in some of the surgeries what you mentioned recurrent states following your uh, excision do you interpose anything so yes yeah, so the radio on a synostosis we tend to place the anchor into position i think that's the best way to do it uh bernie bernie uh 
Murray did have a published publication many years ago, and he, in his experience, I think it was uncommon to have it, but I think there were some examples. And all sorts of things have been placed in there, including putting um, beeswax and uh, uh, also um, uh, silicon and all sorts of things. But the, the great thing about the Ancaneus is that sitting there, it's a muscle, it's vascularized. So, and it, it's, I think it's the best option to place there. So what's important is to make sure you do a good debridement and you're back to normal bone and then put the Ancaneus in a position. And you probably end up losing uh, in the same way, a bit like what David was saying, of what you get on the table, you never do better than that, but you probably end up with about three quarters of, of what you get on the table. You might lose a little bit, I think. Thank you. Prof, I have one uh, question. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there something called uh, elbow impingement, just like hip, hip impingement? And is there any role of uh, arthroscopy in that? Prof, Rajo, you want to take it to anybody? Yeah, Roger was mentioning about that. Did you get me? So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think David and Roger both commented really on that sort of thing. So I think the answer is that there is some similarities there. And uh, Dr. Bain, I have one last question for you. Uh, what about uh, the stiffness following instability surgeries? I mean, whatever uh, reconstruction. That, that, that's a good, good question. Um, again, I think David actually hit it right on the head. It's more important to stabilize the joint. Um, so I'd rather even have an ankylosis of a joint than have a, a joint that's unstable. So the primary responsibility of the surgeon is to make sure the joint is stable. But having said that, uh, obviously we don't want a lot of stiffness and heterotopic ossification. So if you look back that there's been all night, everyone's talking about getting it moving earlier. So you, you make sure it's stable and then you start getting it moving as soon as you can. You may use anti-inflammatories in those patients who are at high risk. One thing that I think that has changed, I think we're getting better at our dissections. Um, and I think that when you use a, a knife dissection and release all the soft tissues in the correct planes and have less bleeding, I think you have less um, less heterotopic ossification. If you have ruptured ligaments and they're all just sort of floating around, all the periosteum forms new bone. So I think when we're stabilizing the joint in a more natural way, I think we have less heterotopic ossification. Do you recommend using, using a, a radio frequency or a cautery because of these things? Uh, yes, so we do use, use that. Um, and we're very keen to make sure that we don't have a lot of bleeding when we're finished. One thing, if you I just want to comment on some of the techniques Roger's shown us tonight, mm -hmm. if you have a look at how he stabilized the radial head fracture, he literally was making a one and a half centimeter incision to open up the radial head to put the screws in. So he wasn't stripping all the soft tissues. He wasn't stripping the muscle. It was, getting into the joint with minimally invasive techniques and stabilizing it. But um, what's important to point out though, that there's no way that Roger started off with a one and a half centimeter incision to do the radial head fracture. So that's only after years of dedication to the elbow. So use a larger exposure to start with and then work down to, to try and getting a more minimally invasive thing once you become more experienced. So you get stability of the joints, stability of the fracture, and then make it so that you're causing less soft tissue. And Roger may wish to comment further on that if he's, if he's still linked in. Yes, I, I totally agree, Greg, of course. But um, uh, one of the things I wanted to add to this discussion is we, uh, we've started using tranexamic acid, acid um, in, uh, in bigger cases. So if we, if we feel there's a lot of bleeding, um, they get a, f a couple of ampules of uh, tranexamic acid, I IV. Um, you can add uh, some intra-articularly as well. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of shoulder literature on it, and anecdotally, but it seems to, uh, to make a difference in the post-op swelling in big stiffness cases. We, we, we do that as well. And the other thing we do with um, any of the arthroscopies that more than simple, we inject lignocaine with adrenaline to actually do that before we scrub up, so the joint is infiltrated with the lignocaine and adrenaline, 
to try and minimize the amount of bleeding. And then if you do it dry, um, it, I think you have less swelling as well. So all of these little things I think do help. Thank you. Extreme uh, thanks to all the speakers for the excellent uh, elbow day. Yeah, and also to Dr. Madan, Dr. Avinash, and Dr. Homsi for organizing this event, and the whole team. Over to Dr. Avinash for the conclusive remarks. Yeah, Avinash? Thank yeah, thank you, Dr. Thank Bharat, you. and Dr. Rudra Prasad, and Dr. Clement for uh, moderating this session. I would like to thank the speakers as well, Dr. Gregory Bain, and Dr. Raj, Roger Van Rett, and Dr. David Tan. Uh, I would also like to thank all our viewers members as well as uh, 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 the doctors who have logged in uh, from elsewhere, from outside the country as well. Uh, I would like to also thank our sponsors, the Alembic company represented by uh, the senior manager, Mr. Vishnu. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to uh, uh, appreciate the enthusiasm of our uh, course coordinator, Mr. Vamsi, for uh, having uh, put up this uh, course. Uh, thank you one and all. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank our team BOS, uh, headed by Dr. Madan Balal for uh, organizing this uh, course. So I wish you all a, a great weekend and please stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. It was really wonderful to yeah. have such a nice webinar. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you.